All right, I want to start by thanking and acknowledging the um, members of the JR to, JROTC from REACH Academy, Pedro Chesley, Devin Gibbs, Deontay Sparrow, Michael Venable, and Sakaira Williams, and our awesome, awesome performers from the Dunbar High School Jazz Ensemble. Thanks, you guys. And Thank I don't you. have your name, but I know you're, you're the man. Okay. <laughs> Uh, on trumpet, we have Jonathan English, Sabrea Starks, Antonio Knox. On trombone, Keith Henson, Brandy Scott, Adacia Hill. On tenor sax, Janae Thomas, Shania Dupree. Alto sax, Jawan Derry. Baritone sax, Tyree Mason. And on percussion, Brandon Scott and Daniel Harris. Let's give them another hand. We'd like to take a few moments to recognize the passing of four of our city school students. Peter? We would like to take the time to recognize the passing of four of our city school students. Jeffrey Quick was a ninth grader, st student at Blueford Gem Drew Jemison STEM Academy, and a soft spoken young man with a smile that could light up a room. His enthusiasm of the Denver Broncos was known throughout the school. When called to the board to solve math problems, Jeffrey would search for the Broncos' color markers of orange and blue, making sure everyone knew his heart was with the Bronco football team. Always respectful, but still highly opinionated, Jeffrey will truly be missed by the staff at Blueford Drew Jemison STEM Academy. Ahima Perkins was a nine-year-old student at the Bear School. He was known to be a busy little boy and loved to reach and grab his wheelchair and adaptive chair straps. Given the opportunity during his choice time, he had always wanted to be on the carpet to explore sensory items such as the shaker, rainmaker, clapper, and even pom-poms that included the teacher's pointer stick. That only improved his good motor and visual school, uh, only improved his good motor and visual skills um, for reach touch grab. He was the cutie of the class. When he first came in 2012, he was so tiny, but he could eat like a big boy. Though he was a vision, 
Th though he was a vision student, he would spot food like a hawk. He loved to eat lunch with his friends and use his fine motor skills during meals. And due to his debilitating medical condition, when he could no longer eat by his mouth, he started to lose weight. He spent half of his school year in the hospital. We kept in close communication with the family and visited him regularly in the hospital. The Bear School has always been there to support the family in whatever ways available. Ahemia will always be a very special part of our lives. Um, Abigail Abby Schrader was a rising 11th grader at Western High School. Her quick humor, bright mind, and tenacious spirit were quickly noted by all who met her. Abby uh, was a constant learner, a sincere, a sincere seeker whose passion for Eastern culture sparked her imagination and motiv motivated her to visit Japan. She loved meeting her friends, challenging her personal limits, and engaging in animated discussions. Abby was fiercely funny and brilliant. She rose above her personal trials with grace and dignity embodied in a Western dove, and she will deeply be missed by her classmates and the entire school community. Benjamin Ben Bolte was a rising fourth grader at Mount Washington. Ben passed away after a courageous fight against leukemia. Ben was a strong, happy, loving, intelligent student who loved to spend time with his family, ride his scooter, swim in the ocean, bike, and eat all of the mussels and raw oysters in Baltimore had, that Baltimore had to offer. His strength, light, and fight were an inspiration to all who were part of his life. His spirit will live on in all of the lives he touched. He will deeply be missed. Can we just take a moment for a moment of silence? Thank you. Now I want to take a a vote to approve the open session, prior open session meeting minutes in the closed session summaries. We'll do this in two votes because our student commissioner cannot vote on those closed minutes. Um, can I have a motion to approve the closed session meeting summaries? So moved. Second? Mural, uh, Tina first, mural second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes. Can I have a motion to approve the prior open meeting summaries? Minutes? So moved. Marnell moved? Second. Second by Andy. All in favor? All in favor, including the student commissioner? Okay. Motion passes. Um, we're now going to do board committee reports, but you'll notice that virtually nobody has a report since there has been no meeting since our last our last time together. Um, so we'll just go one by one so it gives us a chance to highlight the date of the next uh, gathering for these committees. So the Operations Committee has no report, um, but our next meeting is on, in this room on September 19th at 10 o'clock in the morning. The Policy Committee has no report. It has not met, but it will next meet also on the 19th at 3.30. I think that's next Tuesday, so it's just coming. At 3.30 in the afternoon and Teaching and Learning. Yeah, teaching and Learning is uh, Tuesday, September 26th at 9 a.m. Come one, come all. Great. Everybody's welcome. And you can also watch them on television if you're so moved. Um, I just have a, a couple of comments uh, for, the, for the board chair comments. Um, this is our first time together here since the schools reopened, and so I want to welcome everybody back, um, and literally everybody because everybody has a role in what happens with our students during the year. Um, and for our students, and as Ms. Truehart likes to say, for our babies. Um, we're some, we are surrounded right now by so many challenges, not only in our city, uh, but in our state and in our country. So it, it sort of feels like things feel sort of right with the world when the kids come back to school and we can all kind of rally around their success and it's a chance to remind ourselves of what's really important. Um, so thanks go out right now to everybody who was engaged in some way for making the summer a positive time for our students, the students themselves for showing up and participating in any number of enrichment activities. Um, for the teachers and the BTU and the city and the school system staff and the national offices of the American Federation of Teachers for doing the really 
successful door knocking campaign. That's not a way people usually spend their summer, but they uh, st stepped up and did a great job. To the parents and community who do everything they can to support their kids and who are always the most thrilled when they go back to school. To our nonprofit partners who ho hosted a lot of the summer enrichment sessions and who provide opportunities and communities for kids. Um, to the mayor uh, for hosting an awesome uh, back to school rally with and all the people who donated those backpacks. Uh, to the administration and uh, especially uh, Keith Scroggins and his team for doing everything he could to get the schools ready. Mignon Anthony and her 21st Century Schools team for getting our first two schools up and running, which is no small feat. So, and to everybody here who ch chooses to spend their Tuesday nights here. So welcome back and um, just let's just keep remembering that we all have a role and uh, we appreciate that you come. So thank you very much. Um, one acknowledgement of a gift of $3,166.66 to cover stipends for PTEC students at Carver Vocational Vocational Technical High School's College and Career Readiness Office from IBM. So thank you for that. If you want to get your name on this list, send money. <laughs> um, it's easy. And the only other, the other thing I wanted to do in this time of the meeting, um, and this was posted on board docs uh, for uh, on the on the website for people to see. Um, the board uh, feels pretty strongly that it's important for us to be on record and to make an affirmative statement that the Baltimore City Public School System is an inclusive, safe, and welcoming district for all students regardless of immigration status, religion, or country of origin. This is a place where you can be a student, any student, and feel included and welcome. So we have put online a draft resolution. AJ is going to make a very brief um, presentation the board will have an opportunity to comment or question, and then AJ will share with you what the process is for other people to give input. So with that, AJ, I'd like to turn it over to you. Thank you, Commissioner Kashani, members of the board. Um, I uh, don't normally sit in this seat. Um, so over the course of the last year, the board has informally been discussing the issue of, of uh, safe places for kids. Um, some work has been done by the district, actually a considerable amount of work has been done by the district in informing schools of what their responsibilities are. But the board uh, has increasingly asked for a resolution. Uh, much of this has come from advocates who have come to the board and said we should have a resolution on this. So back in June of uh, this past year, the board uh, discussed this in public and ask that uh, we, the board office staff, go and see what we could find and put together a resolution for the board to consider Commissioner uh, Canham and Commissioner Kashani. They uh, assisted us in our efforts and we, uh, we went all over the United States. We looked at other, um, other resolutions. Uh, we, um, uh, we took uh, some, some of the, what we considered were the best parts. We also took um, the work that we're already doing here in the district and we incorporated that into a resolution. We shared that with our legal office, and then we also shared that with the CEO and the chief of staff, and they shared it with the mayor's office. So we had a lot of input uh, moving forward and bringing a resolution to, uh, to the board for your consideration. The resolution itself is, is a designating that the Baltimore City School System in Maryland is an inclusive, safe, and welcoming district for all students, regardless of immigration status, religion or country of origin. Now it's a several page document, so it's a, it's a lot more than that, but that's the basis of it. The document itself, it has been posted on board docs and, um, and we're hoping that uh, well, the board will discuss it tonight as well as we will receive some comment over the next, uh, the next uh, two weeks. So we will be accepting written comment from the public uh, until September 22nd at 4.30 p.m. And the reason why we need to cut it off at that time is because the board is going to be voting on this on September 26, 2017. This will give us the opportunity to look at any comments that are received, incorporate them, give the board feedback um, on the comments that are received. And all the comments can be sent to the school board website, which is posted here. This presentation is also posted on board docs. And if you have any issues or concerns, just call the district and ask to speak to uh, to me, to AJ and the board office, and someone will get get you to the phone to me. 
I also listed my email address here. If folks want to uh, email me directly, for the folks that can't see the presentation at home, it's ajbdeluna at bcps.k12.md.us. And the school board has the same, um, the same ending, and it's just school board um, in front of that. So with that, I turn it over to the board. So questions, comments, thoughts? Uh, Commissioner Canham? Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Kashani and AJ, for the work you've done on this. I think it's incredibly important that the board state, um, you know, make a statement that we are in a system, that this is a core, one of our core values and beliefs, that we're in, uh, an inclusive and a safe place for all. If you dig into the resolution, I really ask the public to, to look at it and give us feedback. Um, it just, it's just not a statement. It kind of digs in a little bit more about what we mean by that. Right. Number one is that uh, a student is welcomed no matter what into our system, uh, that um, learning cannot be disrupted um, for for any for any um, uh, for any reasons. Um, if there is an, a need for uh, federal immigration enforcement, for instance, um, there is an appropriate protocol to follow to do that, and we state that very clearly. Um, one thing. Um, another another piece is on student information, and there's a protocol for student information to be requested, and we would not hand that over. Um, and I just think, you know, we know. We know with the recent DACA decision that there is concern and fear in our community, and we want to make sure very definitively that um, our students know um, that our schools are a safe and welcoming place for all. And um, I just really encourage feedback from the community, input from the board, um, but then us to, to adopt the resolution on September 26th. Other thoughts, questions, comments? Okay, with that, um, we encourage people to share their thoughts. Um, we will take everything into consideration, and we will vote on this uh, once we get the feedback on, uh, we'll, revise, we'll vote on a revised uh, document if there's any feedback um, on, at the meeting on the 26th. So thank you very much, AJ. Good job. At this time, I'd like to, um, Call for a motion on the parts of the consent agenda that have to do with personnel and quasi-judicial matters, which includes the personnel employment payroll, the PEP agenda, and the um, appeals and hearings cases. Do I have a move to accept? Do I have a second? Second. Uh, motion by T uh, Commissioner High Hubbard, uh, seconded by Commissioner Berkeley. All in favor? Commissioner Berkeley, High Cupboard, Canham, Kashani, Cooper, Chinia, and Frank. Any opposed? So seven nothing. Um, Dr. Santelisis is on her way. Um, for those of you who uh, saw the morning paper or possibly heard it on the radio, there's a, a pretty important and, and substantial here, a Senate hearing in, in Annapolis today uh, related to um, public safety issues in, in Baltimore and among the public officials and members of the public are testifying. Dr. Santelisis is testifying to represent the school system. Um, so we believe she has testified and is on her way, but since she's not here, mm -hmm. we'll turn it over to uh, Chief of Staff Allison Perkins Cohen. Thank you, uh, Board Chair, um, and thank you for being patient with me. In, um, fulfilling Dr. St. Felicis's responsibilities. Um, the first thing we're going to do is go to the PEP agenda. If um, our um, yeah, Chief Human Capital Officer Jeremy Grant, Grant Skinner is here, I saw him a minute ago. Yeah, I don't think yeah. we've screwed up the order yet. Yeah. I apologize. I stepped into the hall, so I'm not sure exactly where we are. Uh, reading through the PEP agenda. Oh, great. Thank you. <laughs> That's, <laughs> Good, yeah. That's just me. I, I brought reinforcements. Good to see you, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Um, You're hired, Joe. <laughs> thank you. Good evening, commissioners. Uh, with, with your approval, um, the following appointments and reassignments are effective September 13th. First, Crystal Francis, currently Educational Associate in Early Learning. 
is appointed Director of Early Learning. Joel Carlin, currently Educational Specialist II, Secondary Mathematics, is appointed Coordinator, STEM Mathematics. Lori Sutton is appointed Coordinator of Turnaround in the Office of School Transformation and Turnaround. James Sargent, currently Principal of Leithwalk Elementary School, is reassigned Principal of the Success Academy Program. And Lydia Lemon is appointed interim principal of Leithwalk Elementary School. Thank you. Um, Ms. Lemon, Dr. Lemon, I just want to say that's amazing because you keep just turning, keeping on, keeping on with our school. So thank you for continuing your effort to help us on our, our principal searches. Thank you. All right, so now um, we always um, do a little uh, a little description about the principal selections that we've made, and so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, both Ms. Lemon and uh, Mr. Sargent. So Mr. James Sargent is making the transition from Leithwalk Elementary Middle School to Success Academy. He's been a principal for the past seven years, including the last three at Leithwalk. Mr. Sargent began his career teaching social studies at Thurgood Marshall Middle School in Baltimore City, and his career now spans the spectrum of education, pre-K through 12. We wish Mr. Sargent well in his new position at Success Academy. In a career spanning more than 30 years, Ms. Lydia Lemon has served as principal or assistant principal at George Washington Elementary, Patapsco Elementary, Baybrook Elementary, Tunbridge Public Charter School. Um, she began her career as a teacher at Commodore John Rogers Elementary and is herself a graduate of Paul Lawrence Dunbar High School. Ms. Lemon joins Leith Walk Elementary Middle School with decades of experience as a classroom teacher and assistant principal, principal and founder of a charter school. We are excited to benefit from Ms. Lemon's leadership and passion as she joins the Leith Walk family. Okay, so, and then um, next on the agenda, we're very um, pleased to have with us um, Annie Milley, as, who's the executive director from Live Baltimore. Um, for years, Live Baltimore has been working to increase residency in our city to create diverse and vibrant communities, uh, leading to healthier neighborhoods, stronger schools, and more substantial uh, businesses. They are changing the Baltimore narrative by telling the stories of people living in the great neighborhoods among great neighbors who wouldn't think of living anywhere else. Tonight, I'm very pleased to introduce Annie um, uh, with a brief video about one of our great schools, Medfield Heights Elementary. And I also just want to say that Annie um, has been a, great, a partner for a long time for us. Um, she and I worked together when I was in the Office of New Initiatives. Uh, she's a great um, innovative thinker about ways to partner together. She's always a great thought partner, and she's always um, uh, trying to think about the best ways to showcase city schools. So we're very appreciative to have you as a partner. Um, and um, they've made three new videos about some of our schools. Um, they have three from last year that if you haven't seen them, you should watch those too, uh, but the three this year are great as well. So over the next three board meetings, we're going to show those, and we're going to start the, with the one tonight from Medfield. And before we do that, I just want to, just for a point of um, recognition, um, Andy Frank was the first ever chair of the board of Live Baltimore. So Andy was involved from the very beginning. I was involved in the very beginning, but I wasn't the chair of the board. So it's uh, there's a number of people on this board that have cared passionately about this work, and it's really nice to see it this partnership come to a full bloom. Well, thank you so much, and um, thank you so much, Allison. It's great to see you in that chair. Um, <laughs> and um, thank you to all of the commissioners and also to Dr. Santelises for inviting me here this evening. Uh, in, in 2013, Live Baltimore began an initiative to retain more families with children in Baltimore City. And that program, which came to be known as Way to Stay, provides resources for families in three areas, and those areas being schools, space, and support. And with regard to schools, we have a number of partnership initiatives uh, that we believe will both help to retain families in the city and also to boost enrollment in Baltimore City schools. We host casual information sessions on what the school choice environment looks like in Baltimore City for families, including information about how to apply for charter schools and what that process looks like. 
Uh, we conduct outreach to all families who are waitlisted in the charter school lotteries, and we pair them with information about zone schools that have space to take additional enrollment. And we support 17 zoned elementary schools with communications assistance. And as Allison said, last year we were very pleased to produce four videos that told the families, uh, told the story of families who were attending their zoned elementary school and walking to school. And this year uh, we have produced three more. And I just want to say how proud we all are at Live Baltimore to be working with Dr. Santelisas and her team um, on these efforts to increase enrollment. And we truly hope that both the communities and schools that this work touches will see positive outcomes, and we believe that they will. Um, so a few of the board members and staff here were uh, able to join us when we did a big release party for these videos. Uh, we showed them on the big screen at Cinebistro at the Rotunda in a movie theater, giving these uh, stars the credit that they deserved and uh, we're very pleased to share this video about Medfield and what's going on the wonderful things going on in that school here with you this evening Medfield Heights whenever people come to visit our school I hear this a lot we like the feeling in this building. We can just tell it's a good school when we walk at the door. A lot of the families that have students that go to Medfield, their parents went to Medfield, their grandparents went to Medfield, aunts and uncles. When I first got here, I could tell not only was the staff close with each other, but the staff had worked with each other for a long time. And not only that, but they have their own children coming here. So my daughter is London, and in pre-K, London had Miss Ames. My little cousin is in pre-K. She's in Miss Stokes' class. My nephew is in Mr. Worgan's class. Caroline, she's in kindergarten with Miss Mandel. My son Jacob is in fourth grade. Both my sons have been going here since pre-K. Two of my nieces went here. Miss Tate has a nephew. Archie, who was in kindergarten. Mr. Pocus' son. Miss Sell's daughter. Miss Williams' grandson. My hair professional, her younger cousin. And my daughter Jasmine is going to start pre-K in the fall. There's this heightened level of investment when your children come to the school where you work. It sends a clear message that this is the place to be. It really is our family. Uh, and I just I wanted to add, we talked about why we chose each of the schools that were selected for uh, this year's round of videos. And so Medfield is going to be the recipient of a new building. And we know that uh, as they move into swing space and as families are making decisions about what to do, um, it's really important that they see what's going on inside that school and that they're aware of the excellence and they get excited for that new building to open. Um, so that's why Medfield was selected. And I'm really glad that you're going to be sharing the rest of the videos because they're all great stories to tell. Um, again, this year, Live Baltimore will be supporting each of these videos with a media plan. And I just ask that all of you uh, here in this room and that are watching at home take the opportunity to go to livebaltimore.com and to our YouTube page and share these with your own networks. We really want everyone in Baltimore City and beyond Baltimore City to see the great things that are happening in these schools. So thank you so much again. Does anybody have any questions for, for Millie? Comments? Questions? Awesome job. Sorry, I just video. jumped up. No, it's cool. <laughs> awesome job. Okay, very good. Thank you. So look who's here. So Allison covered the official stuff, so it's, it's all yours for whatever you want to add. It's so funny. I, I was, I was going to let her continue. It felt good to sit <laughs> on that. I like it over here better. Thank you. Though. I like it over there better. <laughs> oh, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> oh, very good. Um, well, good evening, everybody. Uh, my apologies for being late. Thank you, um, Commissioner Kashani and the board uh, for um, proceeding, and I want to thank the Chief of Staff also for clearly holding down the fort. 
A um, couple of things. Uh, this is our first board meeting um, since schools opened, and I want to take a moment to thank our school leadership and staff, as well as the hundreds of district office personnel. Um, from all departments who work together to prepare our schools to receive students um, on the first day of school. I had the opportunity to visit schools, um, a number of schools as they were getting ready, and um, truly you had folks working over weekends, working to uh, long hours to make sure that things were ready um, for all of our uh, all of our young people. They were ensuring that 177 schools and programs across the city were cleaned and fixed and open for business on the first day, um, and that is a huge undertake, uh, undertaking that really can only be accomplished through teamwork and dedication on a district-wide scale. And I just want everyone to know that I'm pleased to say that because of these efforts, the first day uh, was a big success overall. Um, and I also heard that our first pay um, went extremely well. So I want to <laughs> want to thank. Uh, well, that's important. Most of the public does not know that. I want to thank um, uh, Chief Skinner, uh, Jeremy Skinner, for his work, as well as the full human capital team. Um, getting paid is important. Uh, I congratulate um, Amanda Ellison, Director of Student and School Operations Support, and Latasha Merritt, Special Assistant in the Operations Office, for the great job they did in monitoring and coordinating these efforts. Uh, I am also very pleased to announce that for the third year um, in a row, City Schools Teacher of the Year has been selected as a finalist for the 2017-2018 Maryland Teacher of the Year. Um, our very own Justin Holbrook, who is a fourth grade math and science teacher at Roland Park Elementary Middle, along with six other finalists, is now in the running to become Teacher of the Year statewide. Uh, this really is a great honor for Justin and the district, and we will be recognizing him in person at an upcoming school uh, board meeting. Um, as Board Chair Kashani discussed earlier, at least I'm hoping she did, um, last week's announcement regarding the Deferred Action for Child Arrivals Program, or DACA, has caused much concern uh, among many Americans, but particularly among our immigrant communities, and Baltimore is no exception to that. The board's resolution makes our support for effective, affected students, families, and employees clear. We are joined tonight by Lydia Walter Rodriguez and Monica Camacho from Casa of Maryland to provide us with their perspective. We will also hear the students' perspective from Jairo Padilla and our own student commissioner, Ashley Pena. And I would like to welcome them now to come and speak. So as you guys may know, this is a difficult time for a lot of um, folks in the immigrant community, including the students. And so I just want to give the word to Haido so he could talk a little bit about his perspective, how he's feeling, right, and us moving forward and continuing to provide safe space for our students. Would you mind um, just introducing yourself just to, so we're clear on who's who? Sure. And my name is Lydia Walter Rodriguez. I'm a regional organizer with Casa de Maryland. Thank you, Lydia. And I'm going to be translating for Haido. Buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Jairo Padilla. Asisto a la escuela de NAF. Good afternoon. My name is Jairo Padilla, and I attend school at NAF Academy. Soy estudiante del grado 12. Quiero hablar por mí mismo y dar a conocer la situación de muchos estudiantes hispanos. I am in 12th grade, and I am here to talk for myself, and also to share a little bit of the experience of a lot of the immigrant students. En la ciudad de Baltimore. In Baltimore City. Sentimos una angustia al saber que el Departamento de Inmigración podría recogernos en las paradas de autobuses. We feel a lot of anguish thinking that immigration officers could target us as we're commuting to school in a lot of the bus stops. O cerca del building de la escuela. Or close to the school buildings. A nosotros o a nuestros padres. 
not just to us, but also to our parents. En ocasiones no asistimos a la escuela por miedo de, hacer, de ser detenidos por alguna gente de inmigración. At many times we do not uh, feel safe and do not attend school because of the fear of being stopped by any agents. Y nuestros padres sienten temor de salir a sus respectivos trabajos y mandarnos a nuestras escuelas. Por eso... And our parents also have fear of sending us to school and going to work. Por eso les, les pido puedan aprobar la resolución. So I ask you guys to consider approving this resolution. También asisto al programa de Mi Espacio de Casa de Maryland. I also am an attendee at the Mi Espacio After School program at Casa. Gracias a este programa, he aprendido muchos de mis derechos en estos momentos en el cual el Departamento de Inmigración está, tocando, está atacando la comunidad inmigrante. And thanks to this program, I have been able to learn a lot of my rights as an immigrant community member during this time that the administration is attacking us. Me han hecho saber cuáles son mis derechos como residente en la ciudad de Baltimore. I have learned what my rights are as a resident here in Baltimore City. Ese programa es un sitio que me hace sentir completamente seguro y me apoya en el área de escuela y de conocimiento sobre la situación de las leyes inmigratorias. And it is a place where I have felt safe, but most importantly a place where I have learned my rights, especially during this time. Me levanto hoy a pedir que aprueben la resolución por mi seguridad y tranquilidad durante mi día escolar. And I ask you guys to approve the resolution for me to feel safer and to have some tranquility during my school day. No solamente para mí, para toda la comunidad inmigrante. Not just for myself, but for all of the immigrant community and students. Especialmente en estos momentos de angustia y inseguridad. Especially during these time of anguish and insecurity. Me quiero sentir bienvenido y no rechazado por el lugar cual llamo mi hogar. I want to feel welcomed and not rejected for the place that I call home. Thank you. Gracias. Do you have something you want to add? I also wanted to introduce Monica Camacho, one of our youth organizers and also a dreamer. Um, here, at, who works with a lot of our youth here in Baltimore City in our after-school program, Mi Espacio en Escalera, just to talk a little bit about the experiences that she's had with some of the, the students we've seen at program, but also a lot of the students that we're working with within the school system. So like Lydia said, my name is Mara Camacho, and I am a DACA recipient. Um, I am no longer in high school, but I do work with high school students, and, you know, we're, we're all scared, um, especially now. Um, not only for ourselves, but for our parents. You know, our parents are the ones that um, have done so many things for us, for us to be here. Um, and, you know, just seeing the ki the students and, you know, them being scared and, you know, um, growing up and for them to call their parents every day, checking on, checking on them, you know, like, I don't think that's, that's right. You know, they should be worrying about school and college and homework and getting good grades, not worrying about if they're going to go home to find their parents or not, or, you know, like something happened to their parents. Um, I know I had to grow up with that, and I still am, you know, with that fear. And, you know, every day I, before leaving my house, I tell my parents, like, please text me, call me uh, for any reason. If uh, you, something weird that you see, please call call me, you know. I, uh, but, um it's it's scary and yesterday um city council and the mayor passed a resolution which it feels good that baltimore has our back and i hope that you guys pass it too so our students can also feel safe mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because this is our home we you know we we love baltimore yeah. um, and we we want to stay here and you know we want to contribute to to the city and to and to this country absolutely great thank you for sharing Hi, I'm Ashley. Um, to repeat what they said, I really do believe that Baltimore City Schools should be a place where students should be, shouldn't, students should feel safe. Students shouldn't be worried about going home and not finding their parents. Students should be worried about their education and how they're going to do better and strive. Being Latina myself, I am a resident and I'm a U.S. citizen, but I do always have that uncertainty if I go home and if I'll find my parents home. 
having that build inside you isn't a feeling that I w would wish upon anybody. And for a student to know that their education is in jeopardy isn't something that no one should go through. I know many who wish to continue their education, to go on to college, to be what they've always wished to be. Their parents have sacrificed so much just for them to be there, for it to disappear in just one day. I am in the program spirit where we do talk about this, and we, are try we try to create schools to be a safe free zone, a place where everybody is accepted and I do believe that all Baltimore City Schools should continue with this. I do believe that all Baltimore City Schools should be a safe zone for all students because we are all welcome. At the end of the day, we all bleed the same color. So I just want to um but first, I want to thank you all. I don't know if any of the commissioners have questions or anything for the young people. I know it's part of my um, comment section, but if, if you do, please, please do. Um, I, I will say this um, from my perspective um, as the CEO of the school district, that you have no concern that your contributions are not only valued, um, but will be protected and will be nurtured your feedback is always important because we can always do more than what we do now. And to be quite frank, I cannot imagine um, how, um, how we in, in this country, frankly, um, expect young people to do and persevere um, bearing the kind of weight that you have to that you have to bear, and yet and still, um, our immigrant students are some of our um, most valuable members of the community. They excel in so many things. Um, they continue to come to school and contribute and work and focus, even when, quite frankly, what you have described would be enough for many of the adults in this room um, not to want to come to work yet you get up and come to school every day. And so um, I want you to know clearly the board um, is, is very clear on where they stand, um, that we will do all that we need to um, to protect you, to protect your right um, as individuals and as, as, as frankly members of our community um, to be safe and to know that you have a safe space here. So I want to thank you for your courage you did not have to come tonight. You did not have to speak tonight, um, but you did. And we recognize and we stand with you in this. Thank you. And I just want to remind um, all of us that really um, tolerance, diversity, and human dignity um, really is not a political issue. It is an ethical issue. Um, it should represent the highest values of a free people, um, but until we as people um, are really, truly, and particularly our young people, we cannot say we are a society that, that protects our young people and nurtures our young people um, when we uh, do not make a clear stand in support of them um, against economic injustice, racism, um, and other byproducts of fear. Um, we do not want your dreams to remain just aspirations, but we will continue to labor with varying degrees of success, um, but frankly with an unrelenting dedication and commitment um, to what we know to be right. So I thank you, and that concludes my comments this evening, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, we've only uh, had this current board meeting format for a few meetings now, so I want to remind people that what we're going to do next before public comment is um, we're going to uh, sort of walk through the items on the on the what could be the consent agenda to see if there's any items to be pulled, and the board will will talk and ask questions publicly about why they want to pull it. This used to be done upstairs in executive session, and um, I want to use this moment to um, 
acknowledge that this is Commissioner Cooper's first meeting as, the, as not being the chair and that we're going to have any number of opportunities to thank him because he's not going anywhere just yet. Um, but um, pretty much everything I learned about being a board member I learned from him. He's my board mentor unofficially. Um, but we should really thank him that a that change like this is one of many things that he did as the leader of this board to make it a more transparent body so that more could be done in the public eye. So I just want to acknowledge that before we move to this part of the agenda and thank you very much. So I'm going to uh, state the item on the consent agenda and if people want to uh, pull it that will say why and the staff can then Go out, go forth, and find answers so that when we come back later, we'll 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 discuss it more fully. Um, so, first is uh, item 8.01, board policy ACE, service animals, second reader, and board vote. Okay, that'll go by consent. Um, eight, item 8.02, board policy KHC, materials distribution, second reader. Okay, that'll go by consent. Um, item 10.01, this is now the procurement items. Uh, first up is item 10.01, professional development services. Do we have any questions, uh, comments on that item? Item 10.01 will go by consent. Um, next up is item 13.01, Interline Brands, Inc., uh, Supply Works. Any question on 13.01? Questions? Item 13.01 will go by consent. Um, there are now three items, uh, procurement items from the Human Capital Office. Item 14.01, uh, Teach for America. Any questions or comments? Uh, Commissioner High Hubbard. For consent for discussion. Um, do we not want to say why at this point? I just, if you could. S I, I think I'm not the only one that has questions, though, and this is we, I mean. Um, I think the reason to say some of them is if so we can so we can give staff time to find answers if they need it. I have questions on it too. They're, they may have the answers here, but we that way that we will take a gap in time between when we raise these questions and the point where we're going to pull them up for vote. vote. Um, it's to give them an opportunity. Is that not right? Is that what we? Would? Yeah. So I think it, I think it would be worth at this point just to raise some of the issues. You don't have to go into it in, in tremendous detail, but so that they have a chance to get the answers. So my question is actually on 14.01, 14.02, and 14.03, just for record, which is I just want staff to give a public explanation, given that we had a, a series of layoffs that happened in the spring. Um, why we have alternative teacher placement programs bringing in new teachers. I want to be clear about why and the purpose and the comparison between the layoffs and bringing folks into the district. Great. I know I have a couple questions, but I want to give other people a chance. Okay, the questions that I have um, also actually apply to 14.01, 14.02, and 14.03. So I think we're basically saying that we'd like to pull all of those for further discussion. Um, one of the questions that I have that I'd like to see addressed is in a number of the write-ups for these items, there was a, a lot of reference to the pretty extensive professional development um, and teacher support provided in these different models. And I'm, it made me wonder, do we, do we actively try to learn something and borrow from what these alternative programs are doing because they were it was frequently referenced as as models and exemplary and so it, I thought gee are we are we doing some of those things for our uh, uh, more traditional pipeline teachers um, I, I appreciated in all three write-ups that there was a standardization for how we showed retention of year of uh, the last two years of teachers but if possible it would be great to have the same data for teachers that come through traditional uh, pipelines. I don't have a sense of, I know now that for the, um, these three models, there's a some place between 75 and 85 percent of t retention of year one and year two teachers, but I don't know how that compares to a teacher that joins our school system from Morgan State, for example, and I, I'd appreciate that point of comparison. Um, and. 
my final question for all three is um, it's not the same as Commissioner High Cupboards because she it was hers was more about priority uh, the, the layoffs and the relationship between the the, the recruitment for these pathways and the reduction in force. Um, mine is a question about the relationship between our use of these alternative pathways and our relationship to um, our partners for traditional pathways, teachers prep programs at Towson or Morgan. It, you know, how do we do we work with them in the same way, and what's what's the relationship between using these pathways and our traditional um, partners? Those are questions I have for all three. I have a unique one for um, item 14.02, so I want to ask one more time. Is there any other questions on uh, 1401 Teach for America? Commissioner Canham? Actually, mine's for all of them. Just to talk about the effectiveness data, how the, the individual programs compare um, to traditional teachers hired. Okay. And so, C Commissioner Highcover, I think this is why we want to raise these things, because I expect that when we come back around, we really want a robust um, Discussion about this because it's it's these people. There's some uh, information out there that's false. There's information out there that's everybody doesn't have, and there's questions that we have that we really, frankly, need to better understand as we look at our the uh, uh, effectiveness and quality and the ability to retain our strong teachers. Um, uh, item 14.02, um, the new teacher project. I had one. Uh, question about that one that was unique to the other ones. I remember last year um, when this contract came up, and I'm going to pull it up here because I, it was at the um, August 9th, 2016 meeting where this contract came up. And included in that contract was something that I was really excited about. It was an additional $185,000 for what was called the City Schools Recruitment Campaign. And it was a very detailed, um, I mean, really detailed what they were going to do. Campaign strategy and message development, visual identification and core collateral, website creation, um, video support, campaign rollout and consultation, expected outcomes. It's Like I said, it was August 9, 2016. Anybody can go back and read the detail. I was really excited about this at the time, and it's been radio silence since August 9th, 2016. I haven't heard anything about this since then. So I don't know if we gave them 185. I mean, maybe we did something and I just don't know about it. So I, I, that's not an accusatory statement. It's just that I haven't heard it. Um, so I, if we did give them $185,000 for that work, I'd like to know what they did, how we, they, did they deliver on these items? Because there's reference in this current contract to, um, I don't have the, I don't, I can only pull up at so many things at the same time. There is reference in this one to some recruitment strategies, and I thought, well, are they carrying over money from last year? Is that embedded in this because it's not pulled out this year? So I'm generally um, confused about whatever happened with what seemed like a really good idea, a really good idea. And it seemed like it was addressing kind of a core issue of, you know, we, we, we need to use the alternative pathways, and it struck me that this co special contract with the new teacher project was actually kind of getting at the crux of the matter, which is how do we get more creative in our recruitment and retention and outreach strategies? And so I'd, I'd really like to know what happened with that. Are there any other unique questions for item 14.02? Um, 14.03. Urban Teacher Center, are there any unique questions for that beyond the ones that were the same for all three? Okay, those are the procurement items. So now, AJ, am I supposed to now vote on the things that I don't do anything? We're not voting until after public comment. Even for the ones that went by consent? Okay, That's correct. Got it. All right. So with that, we will, um, I think it is... Boy, that's perfect. So it's five after six. <laughs> we, we promised we would not start public comment until six so that we could keep on schedule. So we are, in fact, on schedule. So I'd like to start with our um, special guest. Let me go back and find it here. Oh, come on, Cheryl. Here it is. Um, um, Trish Garcia Pilla from PCAP. Oh, 
thank you for saying I'm a special guest tonight. <laughs> You're so you you are special. <laughs> um, let's see. So good evening, commissioners. Um, happy new school year. Uh, I just want to uh, really briefly say PCAB has worked over the summer. Um, we did actually before the end of last school year, we gave feedback for ACE and KHC and confident that our feedback um, has been taken into account for these second readers. Um, we also, uh, just at the beginning of this month, had the opportunity to give feedback for this first reader of JBA and JBB. Um, that's regarding student discrimination. And our first public meeting of this school year will be September 28th. On the printed calendars, it is September 21st. Uh, however, it is correct on the website. Uh, we scheduled it um, a long time ago. We have to make our schedule for this school year, like in April of last school year. And realizing this is 21st is Rosh Hashanah, so we made our meeting on the 28th, just so everybody's clear that some, they might see it as the 21st somewhere, but it really is the 28th. And then uh, finally, on the 12th of October, we had scheduled our public meeting, uh, but the Kerwin Commission is having a, their Baltimore City hearing at Poly, and we just wanted to let everybody know that will technically be our October public meeting. We PCAB will be at the hearing, and we hope that anybody who wanted to come to our meeting on October 12th will please, please take the opportunity to go to the Kerwin Commission hearing at Poly on October 12th. It's the same time as our regular meeting, 6.30 to 8.30. Uh, this is an extraordinarily important thing for all of us, whether we're parents, teachers, commissioners, administrators, to really take uh, notice of this year and um, take part of this year so that we can get the funding that we so rightfully deserve for our children here in Baltimore City and across the state. We're not the only ones lacking, and so we really need to team up with everybody in the whole state to make sure that our legislators don't stop, stop shortchanging our kids. Um, and I finally want to say thank you to all of you for your work on the uh, the DACA stuff, it's super, super important. As a Latina, I take it very personally, um, and I'm very excited that this district, I'm proud of this district mm -hmm. for, for addressing it and standing in the right corner. So thank you. Uh, Commissioner Highcutter. I just want to applaud the PCAB's team for deciding to have the meeting hosted the same night. I think it's a fantastic idea. One small suggestion is maybe you could ask folks to meet in the lobby together. I think power and numbers matters and yeah. folks sometimes sit alone or feel like they're not part of something and maybe they could be a place where they could meet outside or inside or something to sort of sit together and maybe encourage yes. folks to come and we not be will, on their own. We're looking into how to organize for the 12th, definitely. Thank you. Great. Um, I believe that our, our colleagues from the BTU are not here tonight to speak with us. Okay. Um, that'll bring us to general public comment. Um, first up is uh, Sheila Billups from CCAC. Good evening. Um, my name is Sheila Billups. I'm the CCAT chairperson. You usually see me in another role, but I come tonight um, to ask for many of you in this room to partner with me to assist me 
in the Special Education <clears throat> Citizens Advisory Committee. Special Education is a very part of Baltimore City, <clears throat> and I'm looking for your support. Our meetings are second Monday of every month, and I'm looking for you to be there. Thank you. Thanks, Ms. Phillips. I just want to thank Ms. Phillips and <coughs> CCAC um, for having me the other night. It was a privilege to address you all, and I will just add my encouragement um, not only to our board to take part in some of their meetings, but also to the public as well. So thank you, Ms. Thank Phillips. You. AJ, would it be possible to um, just send a tickler to the board about the schedule for those meetings? Thank you. Um, our next guest is uh, Dr. Marvin Cheatham. Good evening. I'm Dr. Marvin Cheatham. I'm the Chief Executive Officer for the Matthew Henson Community Development Corporation. Uh, we're a corporation that last year, within nine months after the Freddie Gray riots, and we're probably more of the Freddie Gray area than any community in Baltimore City, uh, we took one whole side of a street, tore the houses down, and created a park and playground so that our children would have an additional area to play. What we did last Tuesday is we met with federal, state, and city officials at Coppin State University to look at what development needed to take place in our particular community. We're considered to be the Easterwood community in general, but the Matthew Henson Neighborhood Association is specific. Of the six areas that we found that we needed improvements in, one was specifically Carver High School. Uh, I remember Carver High School very well because at the age of three, my dad took me to Carver High School, a school that he attended when it was located in another area. The reason I bring that up is to let you know how many years ago that was. It was in 1953. We have our board of directors has now visited over 42 high school football fields throughout the entire state of Maryland. Uh, we found that immediately we would stop looking at Montgomery County and Prince George's County because we don't come anywhere close to what they have so far as recreation and fields are concerned. But what we did discern was out of the 42 football fields that we saw, Carver High School is the oldest and sad to say in the worst condition of any high school field that we have seen. What we have decided to do, we will meet with the PTA on Sunday. We will meet uh, again with the Neighborhood Association to take the final vote on our direction, how we're going to address this issue uh, on the third Tuesday in this month. On the 26th of October, we will go public uh, with our initiative to raise $4 million to basically renovate the entire field as well as the stage and the uh, grounds itself. We contend it's going to take us probably around $4 million to do what we need to do. We're asking for the Board of School Commissioners to, one, come and visit this field. Uh, and two, to support us as much as you can. We know it's not in the capital budget, but we believe our success has been with the governor uh, and with our federal sponsors that we think we can raise the $4 million and build what needs to be at Carver High School, a comparable feel of other schools that we have in the immediate area. We are the Matthew Henson Neighborhood Association, more of a community of the Freddie Gray riots than any other community. Many other communities have received funds earmarked for us. We figure it's our time to start with Carver to get them a new field. Thank you. Um, I mean, thanks for stepping up because there's a lot of capital needs in this district and it's terrific when an external partner steps up and I would love to visit. I've got, I've got your contact information on this lovely sign-in sheet so I will reach out and schedule a time and let everybody know when I'm going to go and I'd love to see it. Thank you. Other comments, questions? Uh, I would just say that um, having um, two high school boys who played sports, I've had a chance to go around the city and there is a discrepancy. And it's amazing when you have a great field, um, what it means for the school, the, the, the students and the community. So I, I, I love the fact that you're advocating for it and I'll go visit as well and see what we can do. 
Can I make one last comment? Yeah. I'll yes, be sir. very brief. I was actually scheduled to be in Annapolis today. I'm one of the panelists uh, that the senator asked to talk about crime and violence. Our community decided that I should not be in Annapolis, that if we want to deal with crime and violence, let's deal with the issues dealing with our children and our neighborhood. So I was told I need to be here rather than testifying in Annapolis because the children is what we need to start with. Yeah, let's fix the field. That's right. Thank you so much. And I will also tell you, based on the backlog, um, in Annapolis at that hearing, your time was definitely better well served here. <laughs> You'd still be there. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Our next guest is uh, Keisha Goodwin. Of course Keisha's going to speak to us. Give us a piece of her mind. Good evening. I'm here to speak about disproportionate in the district. First, starting with funding. Traditional schools was cut 8 to 25 percent. Charter schools was only cut 5 percent. So when money was given back, traditional schools are still at a deficit, and charter schools had a surplus, which I have been able to witness the difference that it make, being that I have now experienced a charter school. Also, the disproportionate in representation in educational staff and non-educational staff that represents the school, the student body. Our teaching staff should represent our student body, and it does not. For example, Baltimore School for the Arts pretty much doesn't have any African American teachers, let alone a teacher of color, but yet they have a student population of African Americans and colored students. City High School, also, their numbers in African American teachers alone are about zero, and that of color, maybe one or two percent. Then I will speak of also Roland Park, who elementary teachers are predominantly non colored, and the middle school may have one or two African Americans in special ed. That's about it. That's a great concern considering that their middle school is majority African Americans. Why is the district allowing this to happen? I'm quite sure they have the statistics on the staff race analysis along with the student body. And then I would also like to know what is being done about it. Media coverage. There are about 32 charter schools out of 180. So that's about 17% of the schools. 148 are traditional schools. Out of 180, it's about 82%. But yet, in most articles, I hear mostly the names of charter schools and more details about charter schools. And it's emphasized compared to traditional schools. There may be one line, just a mention of it, to try to call it, to try to call it fair. But it, it definitely is not. Testing. Most charter schools can waive testing, opt out, but traditional schools cannot. Disproportion again, I find that very alarming. And why are buildings being built without an auditorium? We know that most parents would like to have assemblies and not have to wait till after a lunch period or lunch periods to do so. I don't, I don't understand. How many of the schools were closed in neighborhoods of black and brown students, or as I would say, brown and tan, compared to other communities. Thank you. Disproportionate for is my concern for this meeting. Thank you, Ms. Goodwin, for um, raising these issues and, and um, keeping some of these uh, issues and data in front of us. Do you want to say anything about the testing opt-out? Um, sh sure. Just to, just so, to refute it. So, so, so a couple of things. Um, first, um, I and I can kind of hit a, a couple of different areas. If that's all right with the it chair. Is okay. Please. Um, so first, with regard to um, testing, I'll I'll go based on memory. So forgive me if I don't go directly in order. And um, with regards to testing, um, all state testing is required for every school. Uh, charter schools are. 
uh, public schools. And so they are required. We report their data um, alongside traditional schools. I did most recently at the CEO Institute um, a large band of charter schools. I won't say every single one, but a large band of charter schools um, also engage in formative assessments, um, very similar to traditional schools. Um, what charter schools do have um, is more flexibility around that. Um, and But they, many of them, if you were to look, have very similar um, patterns of, of formative assessment. So that's one thing I will say. I'm sure there are some that do not follow because that's, that's by design what a charter should be able to do. But many, um, but many do. So there isn't, I would argue, the great swing between testing, certainly not with regards to state testing. That is the same for all schools. Um, and even with interim measures, we have many of our charter schools, because it's frankly the kind of information teachers need um, it, to be able to um, adjust practice and know where kids are. Um, with regards to press coverage, um, what I would say there is we can certainly do an analysis, but I know personally, uh, based on the interviews I have done in the press, um, that we have had actually a lot of media attention um, around our traditional schools, both for the first day of schools most recently, our four SIG turnaround group schools have had a lot of profile. Um, here we um, profile a number of traditional schools when we bring schools here forward. Um, more than happy to do an analysis for you, but like I said, I can speak um, myself given my role as spokesperson within the district, and I would say at least over the last months of coverage, um, particularly positive press, that just simply is not true. Um, we could certainly do a longitudinal analysis, but like I said, I can personally say the schools that I selected, um, Excel Academy, we actually um, deliberately and intentionally went to not just a traditional school, but a school that serves um, students in an alternative setting, school, uh, students that have been um, in previously incarcerated, who have had other challenges, and it was, a matter of fact, um, recognized by a number of folks within the public and the students themselves that we identified that school and we had a number um, of, of members of the press cover um, that as well as um, to both of our new schools, one of which, Frederick Elementary, is a charter, the other which is not. So while I am always open to looking at the data, I will tell you, and I can verify because like I said, I've been in 75% of the articles, um, they certainly were not. Um, overly skewed um, to charter schools at all, particularly with regards to positive press. In the third area, with regards to teacher diversity, I think overall teacher, ethnic, um, racial, and in some ways economic diversity, um, with regards to first generation college goers who are part of teaching staff is something um, that we need to monitor um, within the district. We've had a, a dramatic shift. We've been in conversations with the union about that. Um, I will tell you as someone who was previously in the district who returned after three years, um, the shifts in the composition of the teaching force have indeed, um, have indeed shifted. We do not um, we do not dictate to schools who they um, hire. Uh, we believe that principals make that decision based on interviewing our human capital office, um, does monitor, and again, we are more than happy to give you the numbers on that. Um, with regards to particular schools, Again, more than happy to report, I, I will tell you, and we don't have to get back and forth in a, in a public piece, but um, I do know that Baltimore School of the Arts, the head of their music department, um, the head of the entire department um, is African American. Um, with regards to actual classroom teachers, we would certainly review for you, um, and there have been a flow back and forth. I will say that what we have done, the same is true for city because I've been in folks' classrooms, so we may just be viewing, yeah, I have, the whole, gui the, the main guidance, the head of guidance at City College um, High School is a person of color. So, but again, not to get back into a back and forth, I think the spirit of what you're raising um, you should know is something that we are monitoring because we have seen a shift as well. Um, our approach to that 
is, and again, in having conversations with the union, um, is to make sure, frankly, that in our pipelines, which is a discussion that we will get to shortly, in our pipelines, um, we are making sure that we are recruiting, not just recruiting um, a diverse teacher base, but we are, frankly, um, having the conversations, our, our chief of schools, um, John Davis, um, ILEDs, um, are having conversations with principals about first and foremost the quality of the teachers that they that they hire and develop but also um, frankly who's identified for leadership opportunities um, and that that's another place and the chief academic officer and I had a conversation about that um, actually I don't know if it was yesterday or a couple of days ago um, so I think the the diversity issue um, and the equity issue uh, I'm in agreement with you in the spirit of what I think that you're raising and I would just note not only to you but to the general public this is a nationwide trend um, it's one of the reasons why we're partnering with the union on it like I said in three years away from the district there's been a dramatic shift in the representation in our teaching force of teachers of color we know that we're working on it um, and I appreciate the spirit of you flagging it um, and again happy to get you you know the data but I two of the three schools you mentioned um, I have been there and actually talked to members of the faculty of color so um, but we certainly it does not in any way shape or form um, undercut the the spirit of what you are what you are highlighting and you know it may be something madam chair for a future board meeting um, that we report more in depth because um, it is something that we need to be monitoring Thank commissioner you. cooper uh, keisha goodwin Ms. goodwin help me understand or share with the board what is the concern you have when you speak of disproportionality with respect to teachers uh, diverse teachers versus the population of students I would like for our district to look the same as Montgomery County as uh, Hereford County Carroll County where their teaching staff represent their student population so that is my concern that I noticed that in most brown and tan communities it does not okay thank you thanks again thank you I'm looking forward to the statistics and the data on the articles as well as the statistics and the data of teachers recruited for specifically African Americans and colored as well as retained for uh, African Americans and colored and a while ago I also asked that I would like to be on the testing committee and I never heard anything so on the testing committee we'll make sure that um, mr. Conley um, reaches out to you directly thank you thank you thanks Ms. Goodwin our next guest is uh, Sekou Kasimo. Madam Chair, Dr. Santelisis, board members, good evening. The very second day of school at Harbor City, a school police officer confiscated a loaded handgun. It was a, a Desert Eagle. That's a very sophisticated, expensive weapon, 45 caliber. Officer Leonard Lancaster was the officer involved. And I think, again, we need to uh, show our appreciation by calling him in and giving him that award because they do a marvelous job contrary to public belief in protecting our children and going up against these guys with these loaded handguns moving right along i want to know what are the serious consequences for possession of a handgun a loaded handgun regardless of what the city council or the general assembly does what are the consequences are those students barred from public schools? Are they expelled for good, regardless are, of what the, the city? They are expelled, Mr. Seku, just so you know. For good. They can't attend Baltimore City Public right, Schools. They're, they're, they're expelled from their current school. Current school. Right. Correct, Dr. Garnett? That is correct. That is correct. But they, can, they could go to another school in the city? Well, I'll let you finish your comments. I'm sorry. I'm taking your time. And then I, well, that's what I want to know. I want to know the policy, basically. 
pertaining to that because I hear and read where judges slap them on the wrist and they get three years, all of it except time served is uh, suspended. So basically, they can come back to school and do it all over again. What we'll do is when you finish your comments, that was, I, I apologize, I shouldn't have responded right then. I should have allowed you to finish. So whoever's with the timer, please re return to Mr. Seku his time since I took some of his time. And then what we'll do, Mr. Seku, is have Mr. Garnett um, come up and review the entire policy. Okay, well, okay. I don't talk just to be talking. I'm finished. Okay, <laughs> great. Just making sure. Great. And so, well, uh, Dr. Garnett, would you mind coming up, please? Thanks, Mr. Cosimo. Good afternoon, good evening rather. The weapons charge, that is a serious violation, so therefore the student would be expelled from school up to 180 days. They would then be removed from all city schools. And then we, we handle that on a case by case where we look at all of the matters that were involved, the incidents that was involved, all the details. However, the student is not allowed to attend any city school during the expulsion period. Dr. Garnett. Oh, well, one other question, Dr. Garnett. Uh, what happens after the 180-day expulsion period? The case is then reviewed uh, by my office, uh, the chief academic officer. We look at all of the factors that are involved, and then we make a recommendation whether or not they will be allowed to return to either a traditional school or to an alternative setting until we decide otherwise. Well, I, I will say this for the for the public, though, with regards to the policy and having just spent three and a half to four hours um, in Annapolis, um, hearing varied test of testimony um, across a variety of departments around our crime issue, um, one of the things that has been um, very apparent is that within that time period, and I think what Dr. Garnett has referenced is not that there is an automatic return. So I don't want the public to hear that it's an automatic return, but what we are committed to doing is reviewing each case. So the automatic action is the 180-day expulsion. At the end of that period, because frankly with young people, we have a variety of reasons that drive why that might happen. Yes, it is absolutely a danger. That is why the immediate action is taken. Um, but one of the things, like I said, having just come from spending four hours in state testimony um, around um, the increasing uh, crime rate in Baltimore City, that we all, all of those of us who testified, um, know is that it is, it's a multifaceted issue. And so what that affords the opportunity for the young person to do is to have their individual case reviewed after the automatic action has taken place. And I think that's what Dr. Garnett has described. It does not mean at the end of 180 days, every young person returns back to their old school. That's not what it means. Um, but it doesn't mean that there's a review because with young people and what we have found is that there are a variety of reasons that, that this happens. I do agree that we absolutely should applaud and honor the school police officer um, who apprehended the weapon because it was um, a, a courageous act and one that protected and kept students safe. Um, but with regards to the policy, um, we've been very clear that there are a variety of reasons that drive young people's actions and um, that, 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 that each case is reviewed, sir. And we're mo I'm more than happy um, afterwards to have staff. I can certainly talk to you. Th there are a variety. And when you live day to day in schools the way that I have for the last, you know, well, I haven't lived day to day in schools in a long time. Sometimes I wish I was still. Um, but, but one of the things that you find out is that there are a variety of circumstances. And what this does is it affords that young person the right to have those circumstances taken into account. It does not mean, as I've said before, and I'll restate again, that there is an automatic re-entry back into the school. So there are a variety of circumstances. I'm not going to report um, individual students' cases, but we have had instances um, where young people have been returned, say, to an alternative setting. Um, because of the state of the city that we live in, it's, it's, believe me, there are a variety of, of reasons why young people 
um, do that. Thank you. Thank you. Our final guest uh, tonight for public comment is Kim Trueheart. Three minutes is not enough. I was late arriving because I was watching you on TV, Dr. Santelises, testify. And I appreciate your time and devotion to our children. I think that's critical. Um, the conversation down there was about violence and how we're dealing with it. And we're not dealing with it well at all. But I am hopeful that the things that you've outlined in your blueprint will move us in a direction that we can be um, more comfortable, that we're helping our children navigate this crazy world. Um, speaking of the blueprint, um, you know, we want to know what's going on in the system. And you had a CEO institute for your leaders at the school. I want that same kind of insight into what is going on. And I think I can speak for a lot of folks sitting behind me. They'd welcome that kind of opportunity. Even Ms. Goodwin's comments tonight were around information about demographics, about recruiting, about your staff. Please share that with us. And I would think that you would want to, to widely communicate that with us. Um, discrimination policy. I've spoken to Delegate Jill Carter, who is now the um, director of the Office of Civil Rights and Wage Enforcement, and she says absolutely add her office as one of the options for filing a complaint. Um, and she then emailed me a copy of one of the city policies around her work that says that she can do that. Um, I think we need to make sure our children have as many options as possible for filing complaints about discrimination. Um, so that was one of my comments. Um, having um, been in leadership before, roles and responsibilities in, in writing are important. And my other comment was that the absence of the CEO position listed and the roles and responsibilities I thought didn't make sense. And so I would like to see um, input around delineating that the CEO is responsible for ensuring that everybody understands that policy, has read that policy, and will conform with that policy. Um, I'm going to give this to AJ. Um, I was late in submitting that to um, my delegate in Annapolis the past session. But I want data on the demographics that Ms. Goodwin was asking about. I want to know how many African-American teachers we have, how many females, how many Hispanics. Um, we have lots of data that demonstrates that having a male teacher in the classroom is of benefit to our children. And so why aren't we pushing and recruiting more? Um, but in the interim, let us know how many we got now. Um, last week, I, I walked into to Principal Manko's office, and I was just elated. I had just met a young man that he hired, African-American teacher, who's going to be teaching technology. And I said, wow. I said, this, you know, and I, I actually, he, he got in his car, and I went over to his car and asked him to roll. And I said, can I take a picture of you? All right. So, so I took a picture. And Joe told me, well, we got three African-American <laughs> teachers, Kim. And I knew that, you know, but I had not met him. And so I'm going to start bragging about it. We got three black teachers at Liberty, right, and one, male teachers, black male teachers, <laughs> and one of them is teaching technology. You know, that's a twofer there. Um, so, Kim, so, I'm, letting, I'm letting you go over time because you're bragging on our teachers, and you've already gotten your shout-out from the peanut gallery back there. Yeah, well, so. you know that he's doing good stuff, and so I have to praise him. I have to praise his staff because they're the ones in front of our children who love them, right? And, and I tell them all, I said, if you can't love them, get out of here because we don't need you. So if you can be more transparent around this information and sharing of information, that's my request of you tonight. 
So and I gave AGA a copy of the legislation. Why should we have to legislate? I had to do the same report for the police department three years ago. And I'm proud to say that right now on their website, if you want to know the number of African-American officers, the number of female officers, you can look and there's a report there. You guys don't need a, a bill, do you? So you've been heard. Thank you. Thank, thanks, Kim. I just want to talk Allison. a little bit about the um, communication around the blueprint and um, you know, we absolutely want to engage the community around the blueprint and have been working to do that. Um, we have, we're trying to get as much uh, community input and engagement around that as possible. So we, as you indicated, Kim, um, the focus of the CEO's institute was the um, rollout of the blueprint. The CEO's remarks at the beginning of the, um, of the CEO's institute was focused on the blueprint and they were, um, they were live streamed on Facebook. Um, that video of her remarks is on our dedicated website and the the website is public website that's dedicated solely to the blueprint. Um, we have um, did a we did a we did a community um, uh, meeting last week, and I know you indicated that you did not get an invitation, and for that I apologize, but we did invite 150 um, stakeholders to that meeting and are holding a series of other upcoming meetings with community to make sure that we reach out to community members and engage them. Um, I presented to PCAB last week um, to, about the blue, that week, last week or this week, it all blurs together, um, to talk about um, the blueprint. Um, I'll be going back to the, that was to the executive committee, I'll be going back to the meet to the with the whole um, PCAB um, group in October. Um, we are trying to get out in any ways we can to talk about the blueprint. So um, I'm happy to talk to you if there's better ways that we can reach folks, but we are trying to be as transparent as possible with that information because we want your input. We want you engaged in it. We want you to understand it. And we want you to help us hold us accountable for our implementation of it. That's the, um, the end of the people that have signed up for public comment. So I'd like to uh, thank you uh, to people who come and let their voices be heard. Um, I think, do we have enough for? Okay, we do. Um, so what I'd like to do is to uh, request a motion on the items that were, uh, we agreed would be approved by consent that weren't pulled. Do I have to go one by one? You don't have to go one by one, but this is an opportunity that based on public okay. comment whether or not something needs to be removed. Got it. So based on what we've just heard from our speakers, is there anything else you'd like to remove from the consent agenda? Thanks, AJ. So um, hearing none, the, uh, I'd like to have a motion to uh, approve the consent agenda for the items that were not pulled. Commissioner High Cupboard. I move to accept with exception of 4.01, 14.02, and 14.03. Thank you for that, um, that help. Uh, second? Second. Uh, Commissioner Canham, second. All in favor? Commissioner Ber Berkeley, High Cupboard, Canham, Kashani, Cooper, Chinia, and Frank. Uh, dissent? Abstentions? Motion passes. Commissioner Pena is an abstention on that. Abstention for Commissioner Pena. Um, Now we'd like to return to the items that were pulled and we'll go, um, I think what I'd like to do is there were a number of questions, who's going to respond to the questions on the alternative pathway contracts? Yes, I'd like to invite our human capital team uh, led by Jarman Grant Skinner. Oh, and Joan Manko. Principal Manko, wow. Uh, on this. Um, I want to, so we, what I'd like to do is uh, there were, we're not going to have a presentation on these. What I'd like to do is uh, there were a number of questions that were for all three contracts. I think I'd like to raise those first and then we'll go back through contract by contract for any, because there were a couple of unique questions. Um, I'd like to start with Commissioner, no, you'll wait, okay. Um, Commissioner High Cupboard, why don't you lead us off? Um, thank you, team. So I just would love the public to hear, there's been questions brought to the board about why we have layoffs, but we also have alternative programs um, bringing in new teachers. Can you explain sort of understanding why there's a need to have alternative programs in addition to having as many layoffs as we had last year? And I know we started off the school year even with the vacancy of teachers, if you could sort of go into that entire sort of frame, that would be helpful. 
Sure, uh, and Chair Kashani and Commissioner Haikabu, with your permission, I'd like to share just some general context before answering your specific question. Absolutely. Sure, I didn't mean to jump over that. I um, Let's just chalk that off to me being new at this, no, so thank go for it. Thank you very much. Uh, so we appreciate your consideration of all three of these uh, proposals this evening. Uh, partnerships with a variety of teacher preparation programs are critical to the district's uh, teacher staffing strategy. Um, so for some context, historically, there is an annual need for uh, 500 to 600 new teachers in city schools. So we hire 500 or more teachers each year. In recent years, the pool of available candidates for teaching positions has steadily gone down, and this is part of a national trend. Uh, so in the last decade, enrollments in university-based teacher preparation programs uh, went down significantly. And looking specifically in Maryland, in the latest uh, Title II report from the U.S. Department of Education, the number of prospective teachers currently enrolled um, in teacher preparation programs in Maryland, this is all teacher preparation programs, uh, went down 14% in one year and went down 45% in four years. So over that four-year period, the total enrollment of prospective teachers in teacher preparation programs went from more than 10,000 to less than 5,500. Um, additionally, re clear in the country. That is in the state of Maryland. In state so of Maryland, in so about 35 or 36 approved teacher preparation programs in Maryland. Uh, additionally, retention of teachers uh, past, past the early years of their careers is a national challenge, even more so in urban districts. Um, we provided some effectiveness data and retention data for each of these three programs, which you, you referred to, um, and I, I'm ha we're happy to uh, share publicly more details of what's in there, but the, the high-level summary is that um, across these uh, three programs, um, first-year teachers are just as effective as uh, teachers coming from traditional pr preparation programs. And then when we look at retention, retention of new teachers um, who uh, come from these three programs is actually higher into year two and then just as high as traditional programs into year three. Um, uh, so then to your, to your specific question, Commissioner Hike Hubbard, with this year's budget crisis, um, there are a few areas where we typically hire teachers or other staff that we did not hire any teachers or staff this year. An example of this is guidance counselors. Um, however, um, our reduction in force in a very limited number of areas didn't change the fact that we still needed staff in areas like math teachers, special education teachers, um, and even elementary teachers. Uh, so these uh, programs uh, particularly provide us with candidates for teacher positions in high need areas like these. Um, and finally, uh, before uh, addressing other questions, I, I did ask um, one of our principals, uh, Joe Menko from Liberty Elementary School, to join us um, for some context this evening as well. Um, Joe is, uh, has just begun his eighth year as a principal in the district and at Liberty Elementary School. Um, and I, again, with your permission, would like to ask Joe to just give um, some, some general perspective from his work at the school level where he has worked with teachers from uh, a variety of traditional teacher preparation programs and all three of these programs. So uh, we currently have we currently have teachers from all three programs at Liberty. So I have 11 uh, of my 27 teachers, 11 of them come uh, via uh, one of these pipeline programs. We have si currently six teachers that uh, have gone through the Baltimore City Teaching Residency, two that have gone through the Urban uh, Teachers Program, and then we have three that have gone through Teach for America and then myself, so um, four staff members total. Um, so of, the, of those 11 teachers, I've been there for eight years, we've been able to retain 100% of the teachers that have gone through the alternative certification programs because I know that retention's a big concern and you know, I, I can't speak for the global context, but it, you know, for our specific school, we've been able to retain 100% of those peop the, the teachers that have gone through those three programs. Um, and uh, they've shown themselves to be uh, very effective teachers. Um, of, the, um, of the 11 teachers, six of them are considered model teachers by the district, and four of them are national board certified. So I think there's something like uh, 80, 
80 or so national board certified teachers in the city and four of them um, are teachers at Liberty that have gone through one of the three um, programs. So we have had great success um, both retaining and, and providing effective instruction um, through the support of, uh, of these partner programs. And, um, you know, we are, um, you know, we're, we're uh, very grateful to them for the support that they provide and uh, the teachers that they have been able to, um, you know, uh, equip in our school. Thank you. That's very helpful uh, to get a in-school perspective. Uh, Commissioner High Cupboard. Um, so thank you for that. I just want to clarify very plainly so the mm -hmm. public understands. So we have layoffs in one category. New hires don't line up directly with those layoffs. That's correct. correct. I've asked this many times. I'm saying it out loud for the folks to hear. And so when you say they're filling positions like math and whatnot, those are open positions that we didn't currently have staff to fill in those roles, and so it was really important to bring in outside folks to help us fill those positions. And we still started the year with vacancies, right, the school year with vacancies, even though we have the pipeline program. So we are still seeking non or traditional teachers as well to fill vacancies that are currently available at the district. Yes. Thank yes. you for restating all of that. That's exactly right. I'll give an example that um, one of the positions where, unfortunately, we did have to uh, um, lay off a staff member this year was um, in music. Not only are these programs not programs that, that traditionally provide us with music teachers, because that's not our high need area, but also because of that, we wouldn't have accepted a music teacher from one of these programs. So last question, because it brought up in public comment, and I want to add to this. Talk about the number of teachers of color that are coming from these alternative programs. I understand that they're fairly high, and I've heard lots of testimony this evening about the need for teachers of color in our schools. So if you could speak to that quickly, and then I'll, I'll yield the floor. Sure. I do not, we do not have, and I don't know if we can get it this quickly, exact data. Um, it is. <laughs> Microphones off. Sorry. Um, I, there was provided in the backup material, and I would encourage people to read that because that's something we've asked about consistently over the years, and uh, the documents were pretty good. If I would, if you could just answer it at the end of the question period, and you can bring it up. I would prefer to be read out loud. Yeah, that's fine. Versus asking folks to go look that's for totally it. That's totally fine. Yeah. So if you could, at the end of the presentation, maybe go back to that and to the documentation we have and just share that. I'd really appreciate it. That's Sorry, great. No, it's just a shout out because we've asked for these things before right. and the quality of the write ups were really good. So That's right. the, if you could help him find it or somebody find it, please. Page 18. Good. Um, Commissioner Frank, you had a question? No. Okay. Um, I think when you gave your context, you answered um, most of my questions. I had a question about the retention rates for not just these models, but in relation to others. But I want to make sure I understand the implications of one of the data points that you gave. The dramatic decline in uh, graduates from local schools of education, I think you said t from 10,000 to 5,000, I, th I think the implication is that uh, when you look across the state as a whole, so I'm saying this for, to test my understanding because I don't know if this is the right conclusion, that um, supply doesn't meet demand, so that we are competing with everybody in the state for those 5,000 graduates and then the people that want to work here have to then pass muster in our recruiting process, which it's not a given that all 5,000 people are people that we would choose to hire in, in our s schools. Is that, the, is that the essential, what we should draw from that statistic? Yes, that's the reality of what we face, is the, the supply has gone down significantly statewide, and that includes us, and while the demand changed. on our side has not, mm -hmm. has not changed. changed. I would also like to add here um, and highlight um, something that I think uh, Principal Manco inferred, but if we don't highlight it, um, could go unnoted, and that is on retention, right? So retention as, um, are you Dr. Manco yet? You probably should be, given your eight years. Um, as a highly effective principal. Do we give honorary things like yeah, we do in we colleges? Should. <laughs> we definitely should. Um, <laughs> Can't you do something about that? Yeah, sure. I'll, I'll go do something about that. Um, <laughs> but, I, but I will say I think one of the things that we need to point out, um, which, and again, in, in, in being forthright, that 
part of why um, we continue to, frankly, lose teachers and, as um, Jeremy just pointed out, continue to have um, a consistent need for the same number of teachers is as much about retention, right, as it is about recruiting more. And part of why I point that out with Principal Manco here is because part of why Principal Manco, he would never say this, but I will say it, has been able to retain 100% of those teachers is because Principal Manco has the kind of professional learning community that teachers want to stay in. And so in large part, right, we can't, we talk a lot about, um, and I've talked to the pipeline, um, folks about this. I've talked to TFA about it. I've talked to UTC about it. I've talked to, you know, TNTP about it, BCTR about it. And some of what is occurring is not just, ooh, can we drum up enough teachers to come to Baltimore City? Some of this internally, which is why the blueprint, uh, the blueprint's focus on leadership is so important, is that we have to have conditions yeah. in which our highly effective and effective teachers actually want to stay. Um, and so, yes, the people that don't want to be here are ineffective or aren't a good match for Baltimore City. That's attrition we can, we can live with, but it does not make sense for young people, or I shouldn't say because they're not all young. Everybody's young to me since I turned 50. But what, when, when you have people coming in to teach through these pipelines, not all of them are leaving because they want to go off and be a software engineer. Many of them are leaving because they want a condition, they want school conditions that actually match, right, what they wanted to find. And it's not that the kids need to change or the neighborhood needs to change. It's that the professional community and the ability to lead from the classroom without having to, you know, say I, I want to be a CEO or I want to go to central office, they have to be able to do that. So I, 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 you know, in being forthright, you know, with both the board and the public, this is not just about recruiting in. It is about our ability to keep our high-performing teachers in school environments that reward them and help them grow as leaders in, in their profession. Thank which Principal you. Manko does incredibly well. Thank you. I, I have a. I want to ask my final question, and it's it's related. And I've been getting some um, help from my colleague Helen Atkinson on you know just ways to uh, ways to look at this. Um, and that is again, I thought the quality of the write-ups was really great. So thanks to whoever did that. And I I'm now looking at. Courtney from TFA, I know that the quality of information that we get from our partners is, is terrific, so you, it, it works hand in hand. Um, so there really was a lot of language in all three contracts about the, the, uh, the emphasis that they place, and it's not unusual given that they're alternative pathways, so there has to be a strong professional development component. But you know, they, they, it's the, they really emphasized it a lot. So I, I'm, I'm wondering ab about the, do, do we try to, <coughs> Do we take a close look at what they do? I'm not saying we can replicate a school of education because that, that's a different kind of professional training. But there's a, a lot of support and mentoring and encouragement. And the, which one is it? The Urban Teacher Center that has the four years. And the, I mean, it's like you're reading that and you're like, my gosh, but if you can come through this pipeline, whew, you're standing up straight and doing well. I mean, it, it, was, it felt hard to me, real hard, Certainly. to get through the other end of that pipeline. So I, I'm wondering what we, how we internalize that and say, oh, that's the kind of support everybody should get so that we're not just talking about one year and two year retention rates, which is lovely, but what's our three year and four year? Because if we're going to succeed on this, this blueprint, ooh, we need to do a lot better than one and two year retention rates, uh, it, you know, for our quality teachers and principals. So I, I'd like to hear uh, how we're thinking about or do we at all try to learn from what they're doing because they place a lot of emphasis, emphasis on it in those write-ups. Does that make sense? Yes, absolutely. Uh, so first, I will say that, as you saw, there are some similarities across these three programs and there are also distinct differences um, between their approaches. And I think that is important to us that we have a variety of programs um, testing and proving different ways of providing, of recruiting and providing support to new teachers. Um, so I think there are some ways that we have, we have, have learned from these programs, are learning from these programs, and also it continues to be a two-way partnership. Um, 
So one of, uh, one of these programs uh, adopted, they, they used to use a different, um, uh, their own framework for measuring teacher practice in their, in their first years, and they changed, given our feedback, to align that to use the, the, the same exact framework that we use in the district um, for teacher evaluations. So there was a, a, a point of alignment there that made sense with that particular program. Um, so I, I, I want to emphasize that it is a, a two-way partnership. I'll give a couple of examples of places where um, you see uh, professional development described in these programs that we have tried to incorporate here in the district. Um, and again, that also aligns, and uh, those are, you uh, can see that these programs are focused a lot on culturally um, relevant pedagogy and focused on cultural competency. And those are things that are important to our district and we have embedded in our own supports, such as the New Teacher Institute uh, programming and site-based mentoring that we provide to new teachers. Um, so that's one example. Um, I will say I'm, I'm personally excited about seeing how with the blueprint um, and the leadership component of the blueprint, we can imagine new ways for um, teachers to receive other coaching from peers who can serve in leadership in their roles. Um, and I say that in particular because the one thing that is hard for us to replicate is um, these, these programs are providing a lot of one-on-one -on -one coaching on top of anything that a school is already providing. And um, I, I don't think we're at a place at the district where we can provide that to every new teacher. So that is actually a, a particularly strong component of these partnerships that on top of anything that Principal Menko and his team can provide to those teachers, they're also getting uh, regular coaching um, and and from highly effective coaches um, on on their on their work um, and I think uh, principal Menko called out that he himself is one of the alums of one of these programs at his school um, in terms of thinking about how we are learning from these programs um, it it makes sense to me to also call out that um, people who have come into our district originally through these programs really are um, a part of the fabric of our district. Um, you see them in positions all across the district and I think that that is an ongoing um, benefit that we have seen um, from, from these kinds of partnerships. You good? No, one, the, the only other piece that I would um, add is um, given the you know, given the needs here in Baltimore City and the particular needs we have for teachers, um, I think it's also right to point out the flexibility and responsiveness um, that we have from these programs um, that, quite frankly, is often not there when we work with um, traditional um, institutions. Um, we can point out there have been new, you know, uh, many of these pipelines when we have said that we need entering teachers um, who have um, a deeper background in special education techniques and approaches. They add that to their program, the cultural responsiveness um, and, and awareness that, that Jeremy just referenced is another example. Um, and I think that there really is, while it is absolutely two-way, I will also say um, the level of responsiveness that, that often does not come um, for urban school districts um, who are in need of teachers where people are sometimes take the approach of you should just be glad we can get you anybody um, has not been um, the posture of these three pipelines and I can say that on total they want the feedback they adjust when we ask them to adjust um, they add they get better and I you know I, I can't emphasize enough that that that's not a minor detail um, you know even down to what literacy instruction we're giving um, they want to know so that they can incorporate that um, into into their training so I do think that um, we have to have varied points varied pipelines that's our approach um, to our human capital is that there's no one single pipeline um, that meets every need um, and just you know again to further um, the disproportionality discussion that we were re referencing earlier, um, you know, one of the things that we are in communication with um, the BTU about is um, how we get more of our paraprofessionals um, certified as teachers. Um, because one of the things when I was visiting classrooms this year as, as folks were getting ready, I got a chance to visit four classrooms of Baltimore City Public Schools paraprofessionals 
who had gone on, um, had become fully certified, and what was so wonderful in watching them is they had spent so much time in classrooms and communities. They were from Baltimore City. Um, they understood. They had, frankly, um, great relationships already with the community and, and with young people, and in many cases were helping to balance their full classroom teacher's um, classroom in some ways better than that classroom teacher did, and they went the extra mile. So I think the real message needs to be that as a district, um, and I think the team has said that, that what we're really interested in is highly effective teachers, and highly effective teachers that stay, that can contribute, that can lead, and we need a variety of pipelines to get there. So I just wanted to um, just add that and kind of thank the team, but you know, you know I, if you have additional questions. Well, actually, this just occurred to me. I should know this probably, but we have um, uh, programs, you know, like National Academy Foundation, Academy of Finance, d different academies and pathways for kids. Do we have, do we have some, something in our career and college readiness pr program mm -hmm. that's about students becoming teachers? Like, do we have something that says this is a great job? I, I, again, I should know this, but I've, I don't know that I've ever heard anybody talk about it. I will say from the human capital perspective, we do not have um, an existing strategy for recruiting our high school students into teaching. Um, I, I do not believe there is a CT program focused on So on I'm just thinking. Right, exactly. Uh, you don't think that's a good idea? No, 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 no. Okay. Give us some perspective well, no, here because I'm really I, I was just saying we have the programs, the existing programs to my knowledge that we have are around child right. care but not, not the education. days of where people went through the future teachers kind of pipeline um, into it. You, it's worth thinking about given this, the nature of this conversation, given the public comment earlier about disproportionality, uh, the desire for local people, people that understand local districts. Um, it just, it's never occurred to me to ask that before, but uh, yes, Commissioner Chinia? Yeah, since I picked up my microphone, I'm going to do my other spe spiel. From the other end of teaching, um, one of the ways of, of attempting to, I won't say we can replicate, but, but looking at a good practice, we have, a, a, I don't want to say the number, I, I will just say I was, I was with 1,300 at least uh, folks who have worked within our system who are still vibrant, who could still come back and be of some service. And I do know that some of these programs actually do hire some of our retired staff to come and be some of those one-on-one -on -one coaches. And so as we talk to the BTU and I would say Pizzazz, so we, we may want to tap into that uh, body of folks that are out there that are still willing and uh, very much a part of the field to be a part of the community of city schools. Thank you. A very important perspective on that. So what I'd like to do now is, uh, because I know that I had at least one question that was unique to item 14.02, I want to now separate them. And um, if there's no more question, I'd like to, would you be good? I'd like to uh, call for a motion on um, 1401, the Teach for America. Uh, do I have a motion to approve that contract? Somebody going to move? Uh, Commissioner Chinia, uh, motion to approve. Do I have a second? Commissioner Berkeley, second. Um, all in favor? Commissioner uh, Berkeley, High Cupboard, Canham, Kashani, Cooper, Chinia. All opposed? Any abstentions? Uh, Commissioner Frank abstains. I'd just like to explain my abstention is because of TFA's work with Johns Hopkins. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Frank. Um, motion passes. Let's see, six to one. Um, uh, now we'll separate to the next item. Commissioner, uh, just for the record, it's clear. It's uh, six zero one. Six zero. Stand just corrected. So the record is clear. No, no, I'm good. Six zero one. Keep, keep me honest here. Sorry about that. Um, next item, uh, uh, teacher, the new teacher project. Um, I had a different question on this because uh, all the other questions were this were the same, uh, and we appreciate the help. Uh, but my question really was going back to what we, I was so excited last year that we were going to spend $185,000. We approved it last August, and I'm going to just say the sentence that says what it was. The City Schools Recruitment Campaign, City Schools Human Capital Office, seeks a partnership with teach, the new teacher project to collaborate on the design and development of a strategic recruitment campaign that sets the district apart and inspires highly skilled educators and school leaders 
to pursue and maintain employment in city schools. And then there was a tremendous amount of detail about like what that was going to be. Lots, lots of stuff. So what happened? Did we, did we actually give them $185,000 to do that? If we did, what did they do? Um, I'm not going to say that I'm going to link my approval on this contract with what happened on that, but I, I, it does matter to me that when we report on these contracts that we actually get a report on what happened the last time we approved a contract, which is often in the evidence of effectiveness, but this was so unique and so strategic and I just want to know. Uh, I appreciate the question and I uh, also will say in addition to what I, I'm sharing here to your point of bringing back effectiveness of a prior contract, um, we're, we're happy to provide uh, follow-ups in more detail if you would like. Um, oh, I would like. Because, and it's not just to be a, a kind of an annoyance on this, mm -hmm. that th there's been this whole conversation tonight and all the work in, in the blueprint around pipeline and support and effectiveness. And uh, this was a really highly targeted um, program that I would actually, if they haven't done it, I would say somebody take a close read because that's something we should do. Um, it was really well written and really thoughtful. So it's it's cool if we like maybe didn't get it done because it was bandwidth and too much to do. I this last year was very complicated, but was it last year? It was August 9th, 2016. Yeah, yeah. and absolutely, this is something uh, exciting and and it important really was. to the district. And um, it w some of that was done, and I'll and I'll talk about that, and I'll also talk about why all of it wasn't done. Um, so for, for uh, in the first case. Um, there was an assessment um, in that partnership with TNTP that the district was not quite ready um, for some of what is outlined there. So when you see some of the details in there, I know an example is that uh, TNTP was going to help us produce some videos and the assessment was that we weren't at the point yet to be able to, to implement that. So there was a little bit of a step back in saying the design of that campaign and the planning of that campaign required more more time and effort than what was originally expected. So uh, we are at a point now that based on the work that TNTP did as part of that contract, um, we are ready to move to the implementation phase. Um, so the work was done in terms of planning um, aspects of a recruitment campaign. Also, while that is true, um, given that the district was in a situation to implement a reduction in force um, affecting BTU for the first time in more than a decade, um, uh, the Office of Human Capital uh, leveraged some of the expertise of TNTP in a different way to support planning for the reduction in force. Um, so it was a very unique year and that meant that while um, some of the work of that recruitment campaign was done, um, TNTP as a long-standing partner and one with, with other areas of expertise um, pushed in in a way that w could not have been anticipated in August of 2016. Fair enough. Um, I would just encourage you to go back and review that write-up because it was, um, I think it still needs to be done. Thank you. Um, great. Any other questions on item 14.02? With that, I'd like to, uh, do I have a motion to approve um, item 1402, the new teacher new teacher project contract? Motion to approve. Uh, Commissioner Hyde Cupboard, do I have a second? Second. Uh, Commissioner Frank, a second. Uh, all in favor? Commissioner Berkeley, Hyde Cupboard, Canham, Kashani, Cooper, Chinia, and Frank. Any opposed? Abstention? Motion passes seven to zero. Um, the third item, I don't think there were any unique questions on this one, but I'll just give people a chance. Uh, item 1403, Urban Teacher Center. Are there any uh, unique questions, comments about this item? Do I have a motion to approve item 1403, Urban Teacher Center? Motion to approve. Commissioner High Cupboard, motion to approve. Uh, second. second. Commissioner Berkeley, all in favor? Commissioners Berkeley, High Cupboard, Canham, Kashani, Cooper, Chinia, and Frank. Opposed? Abstain. Motion passes seven to zero. So thank you um, for your work. You have something else you want to say to me? I can tell. Could I could I now answer the question like that was was raised? <laughs> I realize I didn't didn't answer the question that was raised earlier about demographics of um, new teachers coming through these programs. Um, 
Apologies, I, I, oh, we did not include this data in the urban teachers uh, board letter, so I don't have that right now, but I will share um, publicly what, what we included for Teach for America and BCTR. Um, so for Teach for America, we, uh, the, the most, I'll talk about the most recent two. So the new teacher cohort that came in in 2016 um, included 63% um, of cohort members identifying as a person of color. 16% um, of that cohort was from Baltimore and 33% of that cohort was from Maryland. Um, the uh, 2017 cohort, so those who just came this, this summer, 52% um, of those Teach for America cohort members identified as a person of color, 10% were from Baltimore, and 23% were from Maryland. Uh, for the TNTP, the Baltimore City Teaching Residency, um, the most recent two years there, um, were 48% and 49% of the two of the cohorts respectively identified as a person of color. Um, 32 and 34% respectively were from Baltimore and 67 and 66% respectively were from Maryland. Yeah, Commissioner. Yeah. So thank you for that. I really appreciate it. And if you could, in the follow-up, just give us the UTC numbers. That are oh, you have them. Sarah Deal, who I did not introduce, but our executive director of recruitment. I think it's important staffing. to note, though, which program, what we're doing. So yeah, please. Yeah. So um, so for urban teachers, for the most recent cohort, forty-one percent identified as a person of color, um, and we don't have the other data, so That's we'll, okay. we can follow up to show that. I thank you. Appreciate and I just that. think You're given welcome. the the nature of the comments tonight, when you break out that kind of data, if you're going to break up people, pe persons of color, if you could also break it out by uh, within that African Americans, I, I just think it's um, in, in the context of the conversation and just in general, we, I think we want both numbers. And, and, Latino. and Latino. And Latino. Let's just break. Let's break. The let's, let's yeah. Uh, let's just break it let's all just break it out. <laughs> as long as we're going to talk, let's, as long as we're going to talk, let's really talk. But I just I want to celebrate those programs yes. for being intentional yes. about recruiting teachers of color to our district. We've heard from the public tonight. There's a concern right now, and I, I share the concern somewhat yeah. about having teachers of color in front of our children, um, seeing themselves in their teaching in their school is important. So I just applaud those programs for actually being intentional about doing that. Commissioner and Frank, Joe, Joe, you wanted to you did, Mr. Manko, you said there were four males of color in your school, but you have more. F female color, people of color also in your school. Do you we want have, to just share um, that? So I have those numbers. We have three. You don't have to. Yeah, yeah. yeah so happy. No, it's okay. Um, we, have, we have three uh, uh, African-American males that are instructors. And of our 27 teachers, um, I think it's 16 of them are uh, people of color. So, right. Yeah. And of that, uh, 14 are African-American. Commissioner Frank, you're good? Yeah. Commissioner Cannon? Uh, um, the only thing I'd say is I just wanted to thank the team again for the write-ups. They were really good. We've been asking for them. And for the first time, I mean, we should applaud the district and also the programs. We are looking at effectiveness data because uh, we got to keep an eye on also that we want to, like, like Dr. Santalisa said, a high quality, a high bar. And if you look at the alternative programs, they are, um, you know, more highly effective or effective. And that's what we want. Now we have to keep them. That's our job, right? Like they're staying two to three years beyond, you know, what are we going to do to grow them and keep them? have great principles, create the conditions, the leadership strand is amazing and part of the blueprint as part of that. But I just um, want to thank the programs and applaud the programs for doing that. But then also thank you guys for capturing that data and providing it because we've been asking for that as a board. So thanks. That um, is the extent of our procurement agenda and our, our consent agenda tonight. Um, thank you, T. Thank you very much, everybody. Much appreciated. Um, The, the last part of our board meeting, we have uh, three presentations for information discussion. First up is a first reader of the J, uh, board policy, JBA, the non-discriminations of students. Um, item 18.01. Uh, good evening, Commissioners, Madam Chair, Dr. Santelises. Okay, let's do it again. Good evening, Madam Chair, Board of Commissioners, and Dr. Santelises. I'm Clarence Parker. I am the um, 
manager for equal opportunity and title nine for city schools and i would like to walk you through um, the second reader of our proposed policies for non-discrimination i think it's, the, I think against it's the first reader first reader sorry that's in, that's important because we're not voting on this You're tonight right. yes i'm sorry first reader um, for non-discrimination against students and also for sex-based discrimination against students Thank you. Forgive me, my voice gets hoarse at the end of the day. This one here? That one right there. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'm not going to read this verbatim. I wanted to go through each slide and sort of provide a highlight um, and some background on um, what we're trying to accomplish here. Um, as you see in um, slide number two, um, or prior to that as an introduction, this came about um, as a result of policy AC, ACA being revised in 2016. ACA um, now addresses uh, discrimination for employees. Initially, um, the students were also included in that. When this policy was revised last year, a um, decision was made to set up a separate a tract of non-discrimination policies that just address students. So. Um, the goals of the policy, if you will, is um, to, re to, re to reenact and to clarify and expand non-discrimination rights and protections for students. We want to make student policies, uh, student discrimination policies easier to find for students, parents, and local school-based staff, and ensure that our policies and procedures are compatible with and in compliance to Title IX of the Education Act of 1972. We're going to move to slide four, um, where the non discrimination policy is actually um, written out. Um, for your information, um, this policy was, was um, cl cloned from ACA, but we added gender identity, gender expression, and pregnancy as protected categories. On that slide, sure. when I read this, am I the only one that wondered why we're mentioning the Boy Scouts? I, I'm not against the Boy Scouts, so, but so of as, as all you, the youth groups on the planet. That, so as you recall, at one time there was, a, there was controversy about the about Boy Scouts being yes. inclusive in terms of gender expression and gender identity in LGP um, students or LGBT youth. Um, this addressed that as a part of our policy and it also recognized um, that the Boy Scout of America has changed their policies uh, to be more inclusive and to allow um, um, They have, right. so I should we, I, I I'd like to suggest that we consider that since the Boy Scouts national and locally have changed that policy, I'm not sure it's necessary to call them out anymore. It, okay. it, it feels like a odd reference. Sure. Thank you. Just ask, Madam you Chair. Did, well, let's, let's, you disagree? I would just disagree in that it has been an issue, so calling them out and saying it's no longer an issue now makes sense. I don't think it's future we need to have an issue, but I think Boy Scouts are in a lot of our schools in the city, and I think parents still have that question. So I think it's good to sort of call out that it's not an issue anymore and we can move forward. So you think included included explicitly in the language in the policy? It's not in the policy, it's just it's just in the in the overview. No, it's in the policy. It's this right, is our policy, policy statement. It's in the policy no. statement. That's what I agree I, with you. Maybe in the, I'm fine with it being in the write up. I thought it was in the, I didn't realize it was a policy okay. statement. I apologize. Okay. Commissioner Frank? Well, I, I agree and although we certainly would agree with the spirit and other designated youth groups, I just can you explain why we would include organizations over which we have no control or responsibility? I, 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 I believe because they have access to our facilities. Oh, okay. Well, that's, that's clear. Okay. Yeah. Well, I agree when the Boy Scouts. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that was helpful. I believe that was the back. That was the background reason why it was included. 
Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, slide five, we talk about, and these are the standards we're moving into the standards, policy standards. Um, section one um, addresses student protection from discrimination and protection from retaliation for, for filing a, a complaint. As we move to slide six through 10, um, they cover um, the complaint process in and of itself. The, the background is to establish a clear complaint process for receiving and investigating student allegations of discrimination and harassment. This slide talks about who can file, time limits for filing, and how a complaint is filed. I do, I do appreciate you moving quickly ahead, but I just, when we talk about harassment, does the harassment, does the harassment need to be within the framework of discrimination or is it harassment broadly defined? What, what are we actually talking this about is, here with this harassment? Is, this is ha harassment broadly defined. Um, harassment based on a covered, a covered category. But based on a covered category? Yes, sir. Okay. So when we get into JBB, we'll be talking about sex-based harassment, but this is harassment based on a covered category. Number seven talks about um, how complaints are investigated. And as you see, there's a clear process that we've laid out. Uh, accusers notify, EEO office interviews. There's a violation we forward to labor relations, and we notify the parties of the outcomes. Eight through 10, slides eight through 10, we talk, we clarify the roles and the responsibilities throughout the process. Principals have an important role. They essentially disseminate the policy and regulations to students on an annual basis. Um, there was a, a recommendation at the policy committee presentation about how this could be done. Um, we decided that one way to do it was to have, have homeroom teachers, excuse me, have homeroom teachers read the summary of rights and protections to students once a year at the beginning of each school year. Uh, they also um, include a summary of the policies and parent handbooks that are distributed in any annual publications that go, go forth. Principals are also responsible for enforcing, responding to, and addressing any acts of discrimination that come across their desk in their school. The EEO office is responsible for investigating complaints of discrimination, explaining the process and procedures to the complainant, the accused, and witnesses, and to provide guidance and assistance to principals and other administrators. <coughs> Labor relations determines if an accused employee can remain in the assignment during the investigation and also determine the appropriate level of discipline um, if a, pro a charge of discrimination is proven. And finally, employees are required or expected to cooperate um, fully in an investigation, respond to interviews, provide information and documents. So that concludes JBA and, J J and JBR. Are there any questions on this? Nope. And uh, Commissioner Canham? I'm just looking at the last slide, slide 18, it said it was sent. Um, oh. He's only on slide 11. Oh, sure. Well, I thought he, no. He got to slide 10, and, and now, now slide 11 is going to take us to the next. JBB. So 18.02 oh, is JBB. Gotcha. Um, so if there's no questions on uh, JBA, let's move to JBB, which is the sex discrimination. I do have a question. Uh, Commissioner Frank. Um, apologize again for not reading this in detail before. Okay. So does this cover discrimination between students? Does that cover or does that exist in um, this policy? Or is that not considered? Th this is, is this student not student discrimination. Uh, student not student intimidation, bullying, and harassment is covered under policy JIC. JIC. A different policy. Yes. This is adult and This and is student. city. This is um, employees. 
-hmm. school staff, third okay. parties. Thanks for the clarification. Okay, JBB. Yes, thank you. Okay, JBB. Um, JBB, the slides, uh, we have um, slides 11 through 17. It provides protection from discrimination on the basis of sex, sexual violence, sexual orientation, gender identity, and gender expression, and failure to conform to sexual stereotypical notions of masculinity and femininity. It adds, um, chapter, uh, slide two, adds resource and referrals for city students. That includes the police and the rape crisis center. Slide 13 addresses, uh, states the policy that addresses all forms of sex-based discrimination. It clarifies the procedure for addressing compl complaints. Um, it shows that the principal notifies the EEO, the Title IX coordinator, and the Title IX coordinator oversees all school investigations that are sex-based. Slide 14 covers the speaks to the complaint process itself. Principals are the point of contact. I wanted to point out uh, to conduct the inquiry within your schools. They contact the EEO, Title IX, um, and coordinator who provides oversight. Student on student, um, sexual harassment or sexual misconduct is investigated by the Title IX coordinator. If the principal is, can, is accused or has a conflict, the Title IX coordinator conducts the investigation. Who can file a complaint? On number 15, who can file and report complaints of sex-based discrimination? Student, guardian, or parent, parent may, may file with the principal or the Title IX coordinator. Responsible employees must report incidents and, vi and victims to the principal within one day of learning of uh, such an incident occurred. The, the victim's principal must then contact the Title IX coordinator. Title IX coordinator contacts or notifies labor relations and investigates um, the allegation. Slide 16, students and employees not are notified who, of who the Title IX coordinator is and how to contact them. Title IX coordinator is also responsible for providing training and coordinating delivery of training across the school system. And finally, in, in policy JICK, um, the that's the bullying, harassment, and intimidation policy. Any, any bullying, harassment, or intimidation allegation that includes sex discrimination or sex-based issues that are covered under Title IX comes to the Title IX coordinator to be handled in accordance with the investigative process that I laid out earlier. The policy, both policies were, were sent out for review to, dis to Disability Rights Maryland, New Charter School Alliance, Parent Community Advisory Board, the Gay, Lesbian, Bisexual, and Transgender, Transgender Community Center for their review and comment. So now we'll open for questions. I know Commissioner Canham has a question. Yeah, I just wanted to clarify on slide 18, it says sent for community review. Um, I just want to make sure that we, we commit to getting Review from these these um, these uh, partners. So I sent them everything. Did you? I sent I sent to you guys. Yeah. Um, I haven't heard from anyone yet. I've okay. actually presented to the parent community advisory board last week. Okay. I would just I would really want to hear what they have to say sure. and get and and then understand what changes they suggest. And I'm just wondering the the, the list does seem a little uh, short. I'm just wondering 
and I'm this isn't my world, but are there other organizations like I don't know if the AL, ACLU or other um, other other community based organizations that are would have you know a perspective on harassment and sex based discrimination that we can think of. So I'll certainly um, be glad to, to look at it and send prior to our next meeting. Okay, great. I'm just uh, I, I'll, I'll think I'll ask board members to think of others. Uh, other organizations as well that could uh, give a good pr perspective. I, on that note, I was wondering. I mean, it's a it, it's a policy to ensure that students are protected from discrimination. So I didn't know if we want to share it with our associated. What is it? The student congress, the the the, the young people who the young people who are the leaders of the what do we call them? Student government. Student government. Yes. So maybe you could uh, check with Sabrina. Uh, I think there, there. I would. It would be great to have uh, uh, some student organizations who are consulted in this. I, I think uh, the Gay, Lesbian, Bisexual, Transgender Community Center will will touch on on some. There are student voices included in that, but um, our student leaders will have some thoughts on this as well. And I, I assume that uh, uh, during public comment, uh, Ms. Truehart uh, raised some uh, had some thoughts and ideas that she also shared uh, by email, and I'm assuming those will be taken into consideration as well? Yes. And, I, and, I, and actually, I can comment on the, on, um, the involvement of uh, the Baltimore City Civil Rights Commission. Yes. Baltimore City Civil Rights Commission, they have jurisdiction. They state in their jurisdictional statement that they cover education. However, I spoke to them just today. They do not cover in-school type of um, activities. Um, student on student type activities. We get complaints from them on for um, employment related issues, but they do not cover um, student on student in, stu in, stu in school type activities. Some of the other uh, comments uh, uh, that she raised had to do with the roles and responsibilities, and it's, it's worth reviewing that list because right. you've got a, a pretty good list of who's got roles and responsibilities, but I tend to agree that there is a responsibility on the part of the CEO to make sure that this is well understood and you know, okay. but that's probably true on most policies. So I don't know how you take that right. into account, but it's worth, I think it's worth looking at. Yes, Commissioner High Cupboard. Thank you for the presentation. I just have a clarification question. On slide 17, it speaks to students based on sex, sexual orientation, gender expression, gender identity, they develop Title IX considerations will be another policy, but that's around har harassment and bullying. But under discrimination, it doesn't actually call out those groups, and I'm so understanding where in this policy does it address that, or will that also be addressed I'm so, I'm in the other policy? So, so um, policy JIC just, address, just ad, uh, addresses harassment, bullying, and intimidation in general. However, when that when those elements take on um, a sex-based dimension, if it's based on sex, if it's based on uh, somebody's uh, transgender status. Um, then it falls into, into a Title IX category, and that's when it comes to me. That's I, why I understand that. That's not my question. Right. I'm sorry. Let me clarify. Here it states that this is around harassment and bullying. Mm -hmm. I, what I don't see stated clearly is discrimination based on those classes as well. And JIC, and this, that's not this policy. JIC, JIC doesn't address that. So where would that be addressed? What? Harassment? Discrimination. discrimination. This, this is discrimination based on sex. Right? So right. I'm asking, so just, based on gender identity, transgender, et cetera, where does that get addressed based on discrimination practice for those individuals? In the first policy in JBA. Okay. I didn't see it in that, but thank you. Okay. Questions, so. comments? So now uh, this is open for comment. Can, can somebody remind me of the time frame, timeline on this? So it's it's open for comment on, until how, for how long before Joe, it comes before it comes back for second reader. Joe, Joe uh, what, we second reader is the twenty. It's the next meeting, I think. All next right, meeting. it's the next meeting, so it's open until the next meeting. Okay, great. So there's a two week period uh, where people can offer comments. So uh, when we we would expect on the twenty sixth to see um, any uh, uh, potentially revised document based on and uh, get some understanding of the kind of input that we received, and then we'll vote on second reader. Yep. Great, thank you. Thank, thank you very much. There is one final presentation, item 18.03.
an out of cycle portfolio recommendations update to 21st century buildings plan Calverton and James Mosher. Kishoni, before they get started, it's going to be voted on on October 10th is a second reader. September 26th is too fast, but turn around. It'll be okay. October 10th. Okay. A correction. So you have longer to provide input. Great. Thank you. Good evening, board members and Dr. Santelisis. Um, Nicole Price, uh, Community and Public Relations Director for 21st Century Buildings. Don Chari, Director of 21st Century Learning. Good evening. So Dawn and I are going to share a brief presentation uh, with you on the recommendation to um, change the grade configuration bands for Cowardson and um, Mosier uh, as a part of the 21st Century Buildings Plan. Uh, both Cowardson Elementary Middle School and James Mosier Elementary School are slated or scheduled to um, be renovated or rebuilt under the plan, with Alexander Hamilton scheduled to close once those two buildings are done. Um, and looking at enrollment projections for both of the schools, uh, we are here tonight to present um, a grade change recommendation um, for those schools to the board. And the recommendation is to change J. Mosier Elementary School's grade configuration from a pre-K to five program to a pre-K through second grade program as of June um, 2019 or when construction is completed and to change Calverton Elementary Middle School's grade configuration from a pre-K through eighth grade program to a third through eighth grade program as of June 2019 or again when construction is completed. Um, we looked at all three schools and the data for all three schools when um, looking at this considerations for this configuration and there are 1144 pre-K through eighth grade students as of last year in these three schools. If the new configurations are approved, then the projections, uh, based on these projections, there will be roughly 400 students at J. Mosier, and that's compared to about 250 as we speak now, so it's increasing the enrollment in, for that program, and 670 students at Calverton, which is a slight increase to their current 640. Um, James Mosher would then be a four-section school, so each grade level would have four sections. Currently, they have mostly one-section school. There may be one or two grade levels with two sections, depending per year, but they're uh, much lower in terms of their numbers right now. And Calverton would have three sections in elementary grades. They currently have one section in elementary grades, and they would continue to have five or six sections in the middle grades, depending on the grade level and the number of students for that year. The opportunities and um, some of the reasons for potential grade configurations is it really allows, um, if approved, some instructional strategies to really be focused in how we deal with primary age students, um, as well as maximizing opportunities for teacher collaboration. At both schools um, and certain grade levels, there's only one teacher, so there's no one to really collaborate with and lesson plan together. And in these grade configurations, it would allow for three or four teachers in the elementary levels to really plan together and to work together. Um, so we see that as a, a great opportunity. It also allows both programs, particularly the James Mosier program, to have a, a sustainable size for more robust academic programming going up to a 400 size. And so as AJ said, um, we're proposing to move the, um, have the board vote on October the 10th. That will allow us an opportunity to do um, more engagement with the community. We had originally anticipated doing engagement over the summer, um, but due to a lot of vacations um, across the three schools, it was difficult to get a number of meetings uh, scheduled in July and August. Um, we did have three meetings, one at each of the individual schools before school ended. Um, we recently had another meeting with the principals um, just before school started. And we have three meetings planned, again, one at each of the individual schools, as well as at the end of the last, at the end of summer, we requested members, um, staff, parents, and community members to participate in an uh, ongoing committee. So we will hold, hold those meetings as well as a committee meeting immediately following the meeting um, to discuss academic planning process, um, culture and climate, and things that we heard from them back in June before school ended um, that were, uh, they raised as concerns. Commissioner Canham? That was that's what I was asked. <laughs> that, that was really helpful. That at the last um, 
last minute that you just shared about how you've been involving the community. But I guess no matter how we do this, we always get right before the you know community concerns that they have not been heard. And so I want to kind of nip that and basically make sure we're being as inclusive as possible. So can you just share a little bit about um, what's attendance been like? What are the concerns that we're hearing? This is a lot of movement around for students. And so um, what is it like what does it practically mean for families and where their kids would go and transportation and can you just break it down for me a little bit more um, because I'd like to know what the concerns are and, um, from the families sure so um, as we said we did the meetings at the end of the school year and so as you can imagine um, yeah. staff and everyone was ready to yeah. start this summer so the meetings were not well attended um, our plan was to try to do them over the summer with those committee members, but because of vacation schedules, we would have had probably fewer people at the meetings if we had done if we did them in July and August. Um, so one of the requests, so I think the board was originally going to vote on this in September, pushing it back allows us to do um, some more engagement. We have identified members who have agreed to be on the, the committee. We've asked, we're asking them to help us with getting more uh, attendance of uh, parents at the meetings. Um, my team will also be calling um, every single student or parent on the enrollment list um, that we have good phone numbers for. Uh, I don't know that we have, um, just given the number of other schools that we have engagement, well, I don't know if we have time to do door knocking, but we will make a commitment to get as many people to the meetings um, as possible. Some of the concerns that have been raised um, primarily focus around um, middle school um, and concerns with the culture and climate of the middle school students um, at Calverton particularly around dismissal. Um, so we have um, developed a transition engagement plan for every school that's combined in the 21st century, whether they're experiencing a great change or not. Uh, we've been meeting with principals and staff to go over the, those, um, those um, activities, and we will be implementing those to address some of the parents' concerns. So one of the meetings, will, we will go over that transition plan, get mm -hmm. their feedback, um, and then begin to implement those. So everything from student focus groups, parent focus groups, parent one-on-ones, um, student Lego build activities, um, student videos, uh, picture projects of their schools. We have any number of activities that we're planning to do with students and families. Um, we're also working with um, some additional partners to allow, to ensure that parents have an opportunity to express any frustrations or concerns about the recommendation with us not actually being in the room. Um, and then incorporating restorative practices um, in all of the meetings. So oftentimes we try to start meetings with circles and end with circles. Um, and so we're trying to address the, the climate issues, which is one of the things we hear a lot about. Um, we also hear about academic and yes, and so we also will move forward with the academic planning process with these schools later on as we get closer to opening the buildings. And as part of that, we are going to share in these upcoming meetings what that process will be for parents and families. Um, we Within the, the academic planning, we also have a component around climate and culture. So we do look at, is the school newly implementing restorative practices or another type of program? Are they looking at um, transitions and movement and those types of things within the building? So there's lots of steps to that process that we'll share with parents what that looks like moving forward. And then as we move forward with those processes, we have lots of feedback loops for parents and community through school family councils, through parent nights, through a variety of other means, and so we'll share so, those opportunities. As so well. I guess my question is, I'm not understanding Alexander Hamilton. Like, so it's going to be closing. So are we phasing out that school and starting to send the students over there? What is there a swing space? I'm not understanding how the school. I like the end result, but I, what we've learned is there's mul there may be multiple transitions, and I'm I'm kind of worried about the movement of students within schools. Uh, so um, Alexander Hamilton was already slated to yeah. close um, mm -hmm. under the 21st century buildings plan. So this recommendation really doesn't change the what would happen with Alexander Hamilton. It only changes what would happen at Mosier and Calverton. Make it we, so we won't be sending students from Alexander Hamilton. They would still be going to Mosier and Calverton. So they would still be slated to close. Um, but we're recommending to change the grade band in which they would go into. Got so it. So we're not phasing that out sooner, the students out sooner. It's yeah. just on the same schedule that we said. Correct. They okay. would still attend Mosier or Calverton once the buildings are complete. Mosier would just be a pre-K to second. Calverton would be a three to eight. And I would say 
what that what that looks like at the at the grade level. So Dawn talked about 400 students versus 200 some students at Mosier. Yeah. If you look at first grade, you were talking about 33 students um, in 2020. Even if you close Hamilton and they all go to Mosier, versus 97 students in first grade. If you change it from a if we uh, move from a pre K to I'm sorry from a pre K to five to a pre K to second. Okay, that, that was super helpful. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? Okay, thank you. Um, just a note about upcoming meetings. Um, all in this room on the 19th at 10, Operations Committee. On the 19th at 3.30, Policy Committee. On the 26th at 9, Teaching and Learning Committee. On the 26th at 5, we'll have the public board meeting all in this room. So if there's no other comments for the good of the whole, then this meeting, do I, no, 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 I can't say that. Uh, do I have a motion to close the meeting? So moved. Motion by Commissioner High Cupboard. Do I have a second? second. Commissioner Berkeley. All in favor? Aye. Aye. I don't think anybody opposes closing the meeting. <laughs> um, meeting is adjourned. Thanks. At 7.50 p.m.